Jesse Kaysen, welcome to the program. You're all in with Dr. Bess. So, tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm Cassie, and um, I am from Chicago originally. I grew up in Florida and in Japan, and then back in Florida, and I'm currently getting my master's in dietetics at Nova Southeastern University. Wow, so let's start at the beginning. So you were born in Chicago. Did yes. you grow up in Chicago? Or did you... I didn't grow up in Chicago. I was only there for a few years, and then I moved to sunny South Florida, and then my dad is in the military, sort of. So he was active duty in the military for about 30 years. He flew fighter jets, mm -hmm. and then he retired, decided that he missed the military. So now he teaches high school math on the military base to the kids that are living overseas. Mm -hmm. So we, we moved to Japan, and uh, my parents were in Japan for five years. I was there for three, and my parents are in Germany now. They've been there for the last 11 or 12 years. Mm -hmm. So, but I did spend three and a half years in Japan, and it was a lot of fun, a lot of not fun sometimes too, just because moving at any age is not always a fun thing to do sure. or make new friends. Mm -hmm. But the cool thing is when you're moving to a military base, every kid there almost moves every two to three years anyway, so most people are super friendly, but a little bit of a culture shock. Uh, the base that I lived on was really small, so we had about 10 kids per grade. So that means my dad was my math teacher for two years, which was terrible because he didn't give me any easy breaks either. Because I would, he would help me with my homework, and then I would forget to bring it to class the next day, and he'd still give me a zero. <laughs> because, and I would say that's not fair, and he was like, "I have to treat you like every other student." So. That's good. So no, were, of course that's good. <laughs> I was he was to get, a very honorable man to treat you the same as all. Supposed to get extra points. Um, but it was really cool. So the benefits of being overseas and being at a small school means that they needed participants in every extracurricular activity and every club. So I did a lot of very random clubs where I know if I was stateside, you normally can only do like one or two per year. So I did uh, like jazz choir, I did cheerleading, I did wow. soccer, I did softball, I did um, junior science symposium conference, model United Nations. Um, and what was really neat is that when you go and you compete against other schools like you would here, instead of driving to the neighboring city, we would go to South Korea. Or oh, wow. we would go to Guam. Or we would go to like wherever the neighboring base was. So where we were um, within a little farm town located right outside of Hiroshima. Oh, and wow. so we would get to go to Tokyo for the weekend for a football game. Cool. Yeah, it was really neat. That and was what neat. was cool is that you need a teacher sponsor always for every any sport that you do. And so the second year that I was there, the cheerleading, not the coach, but the cheerleading sponsor, she, I guess, moved and couldn't do it anymore. And so my dad stepped up and was going to be the sponsor for the cheerleading That's team. Cool. Probably was not his favorite thing to do on the weekends. And it was you know, 15 girls in it. He likes going to Tokyo too. But yes, he definitely liked the job. So, so that's a lot to unpack, and that's that's great. So we have a lot to talk about. Let's go right back to the beginning. When, okay. when you were in Chicago, were you what one or two when you left? So um, I was four, four, four or five. Four. So I have some memories, and mm -hmm. I have yeah, I remember the snow, and we were okay. working for a lot of family up there. So okay, uh, that's where my mom is from. That's where she was born and raised in Chicago. She went to school, um, and then. She had a really interesting life as well. So she went to law school while she was a flight attendant working for Canyon. Canyon was where she met my dad. Mm -hmm. And then I guess because that's where her family was at the time, which is home base for them when, when I showed up. Nice. So you, are you the youngest child, middle child? Um, I am the only child of one mm -hmm. name, real girl. Mm -hmm. But I am my mom's oldest daughter. Okay. So I have. The blended family that everybody has, I feel like, well, not everybody, but a lot of people in the United States has. Mm -hmm. So my mom remarried when I was five. And so my dad, that's actually the one that was responsible for us to move to Japan, is really my stepdad. But okay. He's raised me since I was five. Mm -hmm. So he's more of my dad than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And I have a great relationship with my real dad as well, but I spent growing up with my mm -hmm. other dad. So I just like to call that every day. Well, um, so that's interesting. I, I, you don't mind talking about that no, a little bit. No, no. um, so when you were five years old, your 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 stepfather, your your military father, yeah. 
I guess that's how I'll call it, the military dad. He basically became your father. Yes. Did you did you know your father at that point, or did you meet him later on in life? I knew my, I always knew my, my real dad, his name was Bob. So everybody, it's really funny, everybody worked for Pan Am. My stepmom and my mom flew together at Pan Am. My mom met my real dad through Pan Am, and my mom met my other dad through Pan Am as well. Mm-hmm. So it's just a nice, you can thank Pan Am. And Pan Am is no longer. No, Pan Am is no gone. longer. Um, no, I knew exactly, I was just, I knew I got another dad, and I knew I was really lucky that I got two dads growing up. Uh, when we lived in South Florida, my real dad was working in Saudi Arabia for, I believe it was called Saudi Air. It's the airplane that has the green tail and like two swords mm-hmm. on it. And so he was working over there when I was working, or when I was living in Fort Lauderdale. And it was cool because as a little kid, my dad would send me, my real dad would send me a map and he would give me pins and if he would call, my job was to find on the map where he was. Oh, nice. So I always grew up. Of travel is like super important to everybody in my family. Everybody in my family has traveled a lot. Mm-hmm. And it's just really neat to be able to grow up getting the experience mm-hmm. other people. That's true. That's the this, this experience most people have. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of nice to hear about that. So you went from Chicago around three, moved to Fort Lauderdale. Yes. And so you were in Fort Lauderdale for most of your I family. was here until seventh grade. Okay. Seventh grade. And then. So you, Mm-hmm. 12 or 13. Okay. My birthday's in June, so I'm on the, not on the class, but I'm definitely in favor. Okay. And then, so I did 8th grade, ninth grade, and 10th grade in Japan. Okay. And then, about like probably the summer, like halfway through the summer before I was going into my junior year, my parents decided that finishing high school in Florida would be better for me education wise, just mm-hmm. because. Where I lived in Japan, there's about 10 kids per grade, and they thought that I needed a little bit more of a well-rounded high school experience, especially with some of the schools that I wanted to go to in South Florida, or were in the state of Florida. Mm-hmm. So I was sent back to South Florida to live with a family friend, and I finished my junior and senior year at American Airlines. Okay. So what was that like when you went from Florida and you landed in uh, probably Tokyo, I guess? Oh, okay. So in... You can fly directly, you can fly commercial air, but in the military they have something that you can fly, it's like a, a shuttle per se, it's, when I, it's just a regular air, but it hits all the bases, so it starts in LAX, and then it goes to Seattle, and then from Seattle it goes to Tokyo, there's a base in Tokyo called Amisawa, and then it goes to another base, I think called uh, Sasebo, which is a naval base, and then it ends up and then it goes back the same way. And it just keeps flying that route over and over and over again. So that's kind of how you go to and from when you're traveling to go to a base. And so the, the flight's long. It's, I think, maybe like 15 hours, maybe, maybe, or maybe 12. It's a long flight. I know that the first time that my mom and I flew over there when we were living there, my dad had gone ahead of time. So it was me, my mom, and it's also my little sisters who are twins. And at the time, we were three. And they kicked the seat in front of us the entire flight. I mean, it, it was it was pretty bad. And I remember my mom and I felt really bad. And we thought we'll never see this person again. And this person ended up being our neighbor for a year. <laughs> and still in talk to us. <laughs> um, but that part was cool. And then so when you kind of like when you work at the airlines, how you can get passes to fly for free. You also could get they weren't passes, but they they have a special name for them where you could fly. The, the military to different places. And so I remember my parents and I we were supposed to, well, we ended up going to Singapore, but trying to get there was a little difficult. So we flew on the back of, I think it was a, a DC 10. So it's one of those huge airplanes that you can literally put like a bowling alley inside it that's used to transport other airplanes and whatnot. So there was, you know, us, a few other families, and then mostly like military personnel, and about, I think it takes five or six hours to get from where we were in Japan to Singapore and three and a half hours into the flight, something broke, nothing jeopardized the flight, everything was fine, but whatever broke was going to cost more money to fix in Singapore, so they turned us around and we had to fly back and spend the night again in Japan. But I got to do some pretty cool traveling with my family because when you're, the way that my mom said it is like, you know, we're in Japan, so flying to Singapore would be the equivalent of like California to Florida. So she said, when you're over here, you want to go to see these things. So we, I traveled to Bali, I was in Thailand, 
and Singapore, obviously Korea and Guam. Wow. Yes. That was fun. That's a lot of traveling. But, uh, when you landed, when you got to your destination in Japan. Oh no, you're fine. Please just talk all you okay. want. But I, but I uh, you know, tell people the continuity. But, uh, I'm just going to go all through your life, by the way. Okay. Nothing, nothing's really left to chance because you're all in. Cool. It's going to be epic. Um, I talk very fast, by the way. Oh, you're fine. Please talk, <laughs> talk as fast as you can. That's, that's perfectly fine. Um, you landed in Japan. Mm-hmm. You looked in your final destination city. And you walk out. And you're in the military base. So everyone probably is in there with me. Yes. But the base looks weird. Well, not weird, but if you're not used to being on a mili- military installation, it, it's different. All the buildings look the same. Yeah. They're all like the same color. We actually lived off base um, for the first year and a half that we were there. And so, fortunately, the Japanese culture, they, they have a very big emphasis on education. And so almost everybody there speaks a little bit of English mm-hmm. or a little bit of some other language that you know, helps you get, get around. Um, my sisters were, were put into, they call it like the Yoshin, which is a Japanese preschool. They picked up on it much quicker than I did. Well, um, speaking of Japanese. But it, it's weird because the country is really, really, really pretty. But I, the one thing I remember is there's like a electrical wires everywhere, mm-hmm. like the electrical poles and stuff like that. And the houses are like very like stacked on, on top of each other. Mm-hmm. On uh, vending machines everywhere. You can buy anything in a vending machine. Yeah, they're big on vending machines in yes. Japan. Hot drinks, cold drinks, beer, um, cigarettes, you name it, you can buy it. In so, what was the name of the city you were? Iwakuni. You want to pull up? Uh, sure. They are really famous for uh, the Tin Hybrid. Sorry. There we go. All yours. Okay, so this is where, so there it is, it's small as far as here, and this is what I was talking about, it looks like really congested almost. Definitely not as, this is the Kintai Bridge. So, and I don't know if this, everything is so small. There you go. There we go, cherry blossoms, Kintai Bridge. And so one of the things, I don't know if they still do this today, but when we were there, when they do restoration projects on historical landmarks, Mm -hmm. we try to preserve everything, whereas they kind of like knock a a piece down and then rebuild it the same way it was built. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Which was really neat. They were doing some of that when we were there. They have festivals here all the time. You can walk across the bridge. The cherry blossoms are everywhere. Is it a, a foot bridge or a traffic bridge? Footbridge. This is nice. It's very beautiful. Um, this is. Oh, this is on base. So they have this thing called Friendship Day, where they open the base and they let everybody come in, mm-hmm. and they can just kind of wander around only on the airfield, really, on the airstrip. And they have like the different planes out there. They have the men in uniform. At the time when I was there, they were very the Japanese people were like very not obsessed but like mesmerized by Americans. I had blonde hair at the time, so they would come mm-hmm. in. Touch your hair, oh, and they sure. would ask if it was real. Oh, um, that's kind of nice. They loved the American culture. I, I never felt like I was in danger at all. I always felt safe. I was actually there when September 11th happened, and so that was a little bit weird because obviously we're there's a time difference. It's about like 10, 10 or 12 mm-hmm. hours, so we're ahead, and so it was my dad and my I don't know where my mom and my sisters were, but it was just just me and my dad at the time. Mm-hmm. And so I remember he woke me up because I was going to sleep. It was about to be the first day of school. And he woke me up and he said, hey, like, we should come check out the news. There's some pretty interesting stuff going on. And obviously it was devastating to watch what happened. Nobody knew what to make of it either. And then I went to sleep. And when I woke up the next day, school was canceled. Mm-hmm. The entire base was in heightened security. You weren't allowed to leave base. You weren't allowed to drive your car. I don't think I went to school for at least like three or four days. Mm-hmm. Um, and not because there was necessarily a threat on our base. Obviously, we're in Japan. This is going on in, in the U.S., but just for security measures. Right. And what was really neat is when we finally did go back to school, everything obviously heightened security. And I would sit in my math class, and you could see like snipers positioned on like the, the rooftop, not of our school, wow. but of like buildings, because the colonel lived right across the street from where we went to school. Oh, okay, okay. So you would see just you know, and tanks driving through. 
you know, playing soccer games, you would have fighter jets taking off, even before September 11th. Our, our mm-hmm. soccer field was right next to the airstrip, so they would take off like while we were playing soccer. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So what was it like when you were, like, when you first saw what happened on 9-11 and knowing you're on a military base, which is, you know, obviously this is going to cause a, a war. It did mm-hmm. cause a war. Um, I felt really safe. I also felt really removed from everything. So another funny fact about living on a military base is that you don't get commercials. Oh. Um, you don't get, so any programming, it's called AFN, the Armed Forces Network, they have AFN Europe, they have AFN Far East, and um, all the programming is donated. And so instead of commercials, because commercials are the way that these TV shows make money and, and ge- generate revenue, and since we're not airing it, or the military's not airing it, make money. you get these like funny, public service announcements, okay. announcements kind of so you'll have like on this day and it'll give you some like fact about like America or they'll they'll have you know this guy won a purple heart for this and, you know a lot of you know history facts a lot of random can you guess this state um mm-hmm. they had let's see what else oh they would have like these things about like waste prevention and fraud and it, I don't know it was really interesting so you only get certain programming, you don't get live TV, or if you do get live TV because of time difference, it's in the middle of the night. And so I felt a little bit removed, obviously, because this is the internet was not what it was today. But um, you know, I'm pretty sure we still had dial up, so it was pretty mm-hmm. slow. And um, you know, I feel like I missed a lot of the emotional intensity that came along with that. You know, we, we were certainly taught about it on base, we certainly taught about security precautions and how to conduct ourselves when we went off base and how to report it and we saw it, but I don't think we got the full thing of it like we did when they were over there. So that makes sense. Yeah. So here you are. So how old are you now? You're 11 years old. 2001. So I think I was 15. I'm 31 now, so I think you're the Okay. Well, we don't, we don't need to do that. <laughs> uh, so, you're, so you're a mid teen yeah. basically. It's almost ready to drive. So um, at that point, you're probably involved in a lot of activities that you said you're in, mm-hmm. you're in some kind of fire. Fire or jazz, jazz fire? Jazz fire. I can't sing. But Obviously, you must be able to sing. No, they fire. have like a no cut policy in Japan because <laughs> literally they need people on, on your team so bad that like they just trust me, I can't sing. That's funny. So, uh, you jazz choir, you did a lot of sports. Mm-hmm. I did modeling ideation, mm-hmm. which was really fun. So I do remember being a little bit nervous the first time flying right after September 11th. It was for a school thing, and I think it was for modeling ideation. And uh, just a little apprehensive about flying because we were flying the Japanese airline. Not that anything had ever happened there or anything like that. But, you know, it was just, mm-hmm. but everything was fine. Right. It was neat. We went, we went to Okinawa to have the conference for Mali United Nations, and I got to, I mean, my potential was like, in God. It was something very obscure in Africa. That's but I didn't have a lot of, I didn't get to like, participate in that. No one cared about my opinions. <laughs> <laughs> we won't talk about <laughs> Um So, in your in school, was uh, college like a, yep, you're going to college type thing? Oh, of course. So, oh. so your parents were very encouraging. Very adamant about it. So your father's an officer in the military. He must have yes. He went to college and he went to Texas A&M. Oh, wow. Okay. And then he actually, we always make fun of him. So he had a choice because my dad is considerably older. He'll be 80 this year. Oh, wow. And so when he had the choice of going to, I think it's called OTC, officer training. Um, for fighting jets or flying fighter jets, or he could work on computers. And at the time, computers were in mm-hmm. big rooms, and uh, he picked obviously the fighter jets. And we always joke. Who wouldn't pick fighter jets? He should have gone with the computers. He could have been like the next Bill Gates. True. But instead, he did the jets, which are pretty cool. I mean, he flew. He flew in Vietnam. Mm-hmm. He received the Silver Star, which is the second or third highest reward that you can get. Mm-hmm. Um, he saved somebody's life. So then they fly. I make my dad tell me the same story every Memorial Day and every Veterans Day. So I hear the story twice a year. It will never get old. I always ask him to tell it because I think it's I think it's really interesting. So they were flying, and his partner, because it was two different planes they were doing, they had to recon together. And so his friend had to eject for whatever reason. That part I don't remember why. 
and you landed in the rice paddy, and when Sven landed in the rice paddy, he broke his legs, and he could see the Viet Cong coming at him, so he radioed to my dad, hey, I can see them coming out, you know, they're coming to get me, I'm down, help me, and so my dad stooped down, and he flew around, and just circled around his friend, and fought off the people that were coming oh. towards him, and so I could get them, and so I got out safe. In fact, I don't remember that guy's name, but he wrote a book, and there's chapters out in that same story. Is that what you're calling your stuff? Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, we pull out, pull up the Silver Star, just because. So you're better than that, so I have a. I'll say, if you just get me there. Sorry. You were saying? There we go. Okay, Silver Star. Funny that it's golden part. I know. So I actually have a, another cool claim to fame, if you want to call it that, on my real dad's side of the family. So this would be my real dad's uncle. This we could call too, and which would make him my great uncle. My great uncle. So my great uncle is Chesty Fuller, who is the most decorated U.S. Marine in history. What's his name? Chesky Fuller. Most decorated Marine in U.S. history. They say a prayer again every night in the Marine Board boot camp. And wow. so the base that we lived on in Japan was actually a Marine Board base. And when they found out, because I used to spend my summers with my grandmother, and his wife was still alive at the time. So my dad would take me over there. She had the best cookies. And- <laughs> That's what I remember as a kid. I remember the cookies. And she gave me like an unlimited supply of cheetos. Um, <laughs> it's a great lady. So, and that was a, a, a so, neat thing to learn about. So yeah. He was. He is the most decorated marine in U.S. history. Okay. And well, I mean, I'm sorry, I didn't know. He's my dad's uncle. He's dad's uncle. So wow. his wife is who I used to go for her now. He had already passed away. I used to spend the summers with my grandmother, who lived down the street from his wife, so we would go over there often. Oh, okay. So, so he. So yeah, not who was your dad dad's aunt. So was your great, great this is your great aunt. Yes. That was your great aunt's house, your dad. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to make sure it was clear for me because I'm, I'm a little slow. No, no, I'm just a little bit slow. That's all. Wow, so they say a prayer to him every night. In in boot camp, so yes. what do they exactly say to him? I'm not hundred percent sure, but all I know is that he's like Marine Corps royalty. It's my all it is later. That was interesting. You know, just the third of the year, is that it? And maybe that's what it is. There's US MC. It's very interesting. First off, boot camps are usually incredibly different. Yeah, I don't think that could be it. Oh, yeah, we want to get too deep into this. Oh my gosh, there's so many things. Yeah, we want to get too deep into this. It's going to be like getting to copyright material and we'll get pulled off the end. Yeah, you do. All right, so for sure, when you went to when you were going to high school, the college was like what you were going to do next. Absolutely. At least your parents thought that, I guess you probably did go. Yeah, no question about it. And I think that's one of the reasons why I ended up finishing high school here. They thought the academics would be a little bit better. Mm-hmm. Um, so I went to American Heritage, which is a fantastic private school here in Broward County. And I, I learned a lot. I definitely learned just, I had AP English one year. So I there, once I was at American Heritage, they have obviously a much bigger school, so I couldn't do all the extracurricular activities that I was doing in Japan. So I just, by the time I got here, cheerleading was my thing. I just mm-hmm. did cheerleading, I cheered for the school, and then I did a competitive cheerleading that was not part of the school as well. Wow. And you mean like, like all those people who do the flips and the all flips kinds of really crazy stuff? There. Wow. Yes. And so I remember my first day of AP English. There, we started the class probably with like 10 or 11 people, and, and by the end of the semester, I think we only had six left. Wow. But I remember the first day of class, the teacher, her name was Miss Papa, if she's ever out there. So she told me to drop the class. She said that this class is not for you, you're not cut out for AP English. Wow. And at the time, like I thought she was saying it because she was questioning my intelligence. But what I realized, and she did say this to me, but I probably didn't hear it. You know, it's 16, you don't really right. hear it's everything. Right, yeah, you feel insulted. But she said, she said, look at these kids that you're in class with. She said, you're a cheerleader. She said, you do more than just school. You know, these kids, like, their social life is school. They're all about the academics. 
she said, you will not do well in my class. Like, this is very difficult. And so I'm, if I'm challenged, if I feel like someone tells me I can't do something, a lot of the times I'm now determined to do it. No, I'm going to do it, but yes, you are. Right. And no longer matters if I want to do it or not. It's all about showing you that you're wrong. So I uh, didn't end up with a great grade in the class. I think I ended up with a C in her class, but I passed the AP exam. Nice. The national exam. And I, I emailed her over summer to make sure that she knew <laughs> that I passed that AP exam. <laughs> I was really, that was a hard test. Mm -hmm. I was really proud of that. So I, I got some really great stuff at American Heritage. I got mm -hmm. to cheer, which was really fun. Um, my best friend, who she's been, we met each other in AP Bio my junior year. We now work together. She opened the wow. gym that I work at now, so she's still a really good friend of mine. And I have great memories for the most part. And then I went to college. So I went to USF, University of South Florida. Mm -hmm. I was originally going to go to FSU, but another stubborn moment of proving my mom that I can do what I want now because I'm 18. I'm grown. <laughs> yeah, I know what's best. <laughs> so I went to USF, and I think I think it's more common than people realize that people just don't finish college in four years. I mean, there's it's a lot fun. of people that do it, and my hat is off to people that do it. I just was not one of those people. I, I struggled a lot with knowing what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So even though I was in college because that's what I was supposed to do, um, I had no idea what I wanted to major. Right. I originally thought I wanted to major in marine biology, mm -hmm. um, and then I didn't do very well my first my freshman year at USF because I, I didn't grasp the concept that I had to go to class <laughs> all the time. It wasn't just go to class. I just didn't go to class very often, and I had I think I left USF with like a one point three GPA. It was. But you had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun, yes. Mm -hmm. I made my dorm room hallway into a slip and slide <laughs> with dish soap and water. <laughs> You'll never forget those oh, days. No, not at all. And when yeah. that was back in university, it wasn't quite so expensive. <laughs> yeah, and not as strict, I think, as well. Um, you know what's really funny? My Okay, so my freshman year is when my, my real dad took me into my my dorm and on, at USF they had these like on campus apartments. It was really cool. It was four separate rooms, a kitchen and a common area. And it was just like a regular apartment building. And so when my dad was moving me in, my college roommate, one of my roommates walked in, her name was Sarah and I'm not gonna say her last name because I just bumped into her the other day. So Sarah walks in with two handles of vodka and my dad is dropping me off and he just thought, Oh my god, this is not where I want to leave my daughter for her freshman year of high school or uh, college. So we had a great time. And, um, <laughs> with, two, with two handles of vodka, you, yeah. it's hard not to. And just now when I was in Clearwater two weekends ago for the sports nutrition conference, mm -hmm. I went over to St. Pete because they were having this like inflatable pool bash thing at this place called Postcard Inn. So a bunch of people were going and mm -hmm. decided to go with them. And I went to go get a drink and the bartender was my roommate from my freshman oh, year wow. college. We haven't seen each other since. Oh, that's great. We're like, oh, hey. Like, well, that's nice when you meet people like that. You it's know, nice. what's going on? So that was neat. So, so the vodka really got to her. <laughs> she stuck with it. Yeah, she stuck with it. I didn't. Um, but I will say, so after my freshman year, I moved back to South Florida. So I went mm -hmm. from Tampa back to Fort Lauderdale just because it was what was familiar to me as sure. far as, you know, I didn't have family down here. Um, but I, you know, I always worked. And so I enrolled for our college. Mm -hmm. So at... When I enrolled at Broward College, I decided that bio, or marine biology was no no longer for me. I think I wanted to like work in a bathing suit. That was my dream. Right. That's why I thought marine biology would be a good major. Mm -hmm. And then when I came down here and I decided to go to Broward and start going to school, okay. my new major was journalism. I mm -hmm. wanted to be like a broadcast, a news broadcaster. Oh, sure. Okay. I wanted to be the person in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. So it was like, the, I started the thinking, new Katie Couric or something. Yeah, right. I, specifically, I used to say, like, I'm going to be the next Katie Couric, but, like, hotter and younger. <laughs> Katie, if you're listening. <laughs> I'm really sorry. I didn't mean that. <laughs> uh, and it was cool. So there was, I don't know if he's still a teacher here, but at Central Campus, they had two classes specifically that really stuck out to me. And one of them was radio broadcasting and one of them was TV broadcasting. Oh, nice. And so I really enjoyed those classes. But... I just wasn't serious about school. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I still wasn't 100% sure this is what I wanted to do. I had like a, I'm sure the internship would have lasted longer, but I knew right away that I didn't want to do it over at Beacon Broadcasting Station, which is a an educational broadcasting station. Their hub is in Davie, and they do a lot of stuff on, uh, is it PBS, I think yes. it is? Yeah. They do stuff at PBS. So I had an internship there, wow. and I lasted 
a week and a half. Not wow. I just realized really quick that like editing and splicing was not what I wanted to That's do. It's a very time consuming thing to do. Yeah. It was really boring to me. And I thought, I don't want to do this. Mm -hmm. I just want I just wanted the quick route. I just wanted to be in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. uh, but right about that time is when I I really I had always been involved obviously in fitness with cheerleading and whatnot. But I, I learned that you could get paid to teach fitness classes. Mm -hmm. And so I got just a, a regular certification, nothing nationally recognized at the time, just a regular certification for group fitness. And I started teaching step aerobics. Oh, wow. Cool. So like 1980s, Jane Fonda. The leg warmers, the whole nine yards? Not the leg, but definitely the bouncing around, smiling, and jumping up and down mm -hmm. on the step. Was it the big hair? No big hair. Oh. But I had the bouncy ponytail. Oh, okay. We well, got to have the big hair and the thought. And they're really I like. Remember the, I remember when aerobics hit. Yeah. And very dancer sizey. Yes, dancer size. And what was it? Olivia Newton John was the big one. Yes. She I was like so. the first one to put out, I think, the first one that I knew of that put out a uh, VHS tape so you could do she it at was home. She's from uh, Greece, right? She did. Is she Greece, Greek or Australia? I'm not sure. I don't know. So, yeah. And then by that time, I, I stopped school for a little bit mm -hmm. and just was off putzing around doing some other stuff. Mm -hmm. Learned, uh, got into like insurance sales, and I did relatively well. I always did relatively well financially, um, but I always knew that something. I knew school. I knew I was going to have to go back to school eventually. Mm -hmm. I just didn't. I was always, I was had the misconception that I had to know exactly what I wanted to do and exactly what job I had to do in order to finish school, and that if I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, then there was no point in going back to school. Right, which is really wrong. well. So, I mean, so I, I needed a direction. I just didn't right. need to know my exact. Right. Well, some people just, just aren't ready for that. Yeah. You know, if the school is, because I think a lot of people, when they get to school, like what you're saying, they feel like once they finish that, that's what you are now. Right. Like, you are a nurse, or you are a, you know, physician, you are this. Or you can do whatever you want. <laughs> you know, just because you finish a degree doesn't mean you have to do it, you know. So you were interested in athletic training, so you became a aerobics well, instructor. I fit, yeah, I did aerobics, and then I worked in like various gyms and did personal training. Mm -hmm. Definitely was something I was always very passionate about, and I enjoyed, and I and I loved the aspect of getting to help other people. Mm -hmm. I obviously like to talk, so it was fun <laughs> being able to talk with people and get to know people and and hear other people's stories, like mm -hmm. we were talking about earlier. Sure, I love, everybody has a story, and I always like to hear. You know other people's stories as well right no it's it's inspiring a lot of the times to hear people's stories because a lot of times people are going through things that you don't even know mm -hmm. and they're still doing this really really well you know so what was it about athletic training you like talking to people but obviously you like to be physically fit yourself yes. because in order to be a trainer you have to be fit sort of you don't, I mean, you don't, you don't, you don't know many be... overweight trainers no yeah. But you want to be knowledgeable too. You know, sure. not everybody that's on Instagram that has a six pack is as knowledgeable as they say they are. Oh no, for sure, for <laughs> sure. Because well, I mean, we, the full disclosure, but you know, Casey and I, have, Cassie, Cassie and I have talked about fitness for a while. I, I'm obviously overweight, so she obviously helps me with that. <laughs> um, we've talked a lot about the biochemistry of, of weight loss, so you know, that's something that I really like talking about because I find it fascinating. Uh, it's also very complicated. There's yeah. nothing. There's nothing trivial about weight loss or weight gain. It's all very complicated. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll get into that. Honestly, I, I really want to talk to you about that because I know you're knowledgeable in that field. But I really want to uh, get. And we're talking about now. I want to understand like what got you to college and why would you choose Broward College? Not that we're a bad school. I think we're great. But I wonder why you chose. Well, I this. chose Broward College because I was living here, mm -hmm. and so because I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, I I started taking like the general education. Mm -hmm. Classes. I dropped a lot of classes too. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, I was going to school off and on for a while, and I don't suggest that anybody take as long as I did. And so, I, I think I stopped too. I stopped going to Broward at one point because I just had to stop for a little bit. And Broward was what was accessible and what I was able to pay for. Mm -hmm. And and the classes were, were what I needed at the time. I just right. needed general education. I believe. Part of those years, I didn't have a car, so transportation-wise, this was really accessible to me as well. And so when I finally decided to go back and I was like, okay, I'm going to commit to, to going back to school, my first thing, my first small goal was to finish my associates. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I need to you know, get to Broward and I need to figure out you know, how many credits shy of my associates I am and, and what I need to do. So I remember... 
sitting, I think it might have been the dean's office or maybe some reading from admissions. And I was only one, two classes, a computer class and a math class. That's all I needed left to, to finish my associate. Nice. And then they, they said, do you know that you've attempted 120 credits and you only have credit for 60? And I said, yep, done. <laughs> Sounds about right. You, know, well, you have like, to find yourself. You know? I had this great habit of starting a class and then not going and dropping it before they could give me an F. Mm -hmm. So right. it was a great, great plan. My dad at that point was like, I'm not paying for school anymore. <laughs> yeah, he's done. Yeah. Cut you off. So I, I did that. I did the the math class and the computer class right away. And and then and then what, right? So mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to go to school and I wanted to finish my bachelor's. And at that point, and it was interesting because I wrote about this in the graduate essay. Right for the master's program, I knew that I wanted to go back to school, and I knew I wanted to get my bachelor's. But I, once again, I wasn't one hundred percent sure what I wanted to do career wise. And so I remember my dad told me he was like, and he said, "Underwater basket weaving, and I'll be proud of you." He said, "Just get a degree." <laughs> and then I had another older guy in my life that was kind of like a mentor and said, "Like, hey, like you're really passionate about fitness. Why don't you find something like in the health field?" Like, so I got on Google and did a little bit of research and both FAU and NOVA have exercise science programs. And so I decided to do NOVA because it was what was close and it was better for me accessibility wise. Mm -hmm. So I applied to NOVA and it's great. So when you get your associates at Broward, they transfer over. Mm -hmm. And so they accept almost all the credits. I think the only credit they didn't take had nothing to do with Broward. It had to do with an English credit from, from USF. Okay. And so once again, I was really just getting my degree to get my degree. I thought it was really cool they had one in exercise science. I had no idea what I was signing up for. I thought I was just going to learn about like <laughs> exercise. Um, and I, I learned about all these different jobs that were in the exercise science field. So I think my first year at NOVA, I thought I wanted to do corporate wellness. I knew that I wanted to have like a career of some sort in exercise, but I didn't want to be a personal trainer forever. And I didn't want to own my own gym seen the work that goes into that and it's really neat it's not for me um and so initially i thought corporate wellness sounds really cool it's like a corporate job and you're explaining how to get fit or running a gym or implementing wellness programs at corporations like google has it progressive insurance has it verizon a lot of like public institutions nova has a wellness Broward program does. Broward, does. Broward probably has one as well and then the more that i learned about the corporate wellness programs, it was just like a personal training job, except with corporate tech. And I was trying to move away from that. I love personal training and I always want to be able to do the fitness classes when I want. I don't want to do it for the rest of my life. And so I was really lucky. I was blessed with the opportunity to do a practicum and a research it, a full semester. My professor, Dr. Antonio, he said, if you do it, you have to do it for two semesters. And I was like, sure, why not? And so I started doing some research as like just a research assistant. So I would do a lot of helping with the data collection. And they did a lot of studies on body composition, how different diets affect body composition. And the more that I did that and the more that I learned with his class and with some other classes, I realized that nutrition is really what I wanted to learn about. You know, I wasn't hundred percent sure what nutrition I wanted to do, but I'm like, this is really interesting. This is I don't know as much as I want to know about nutrition and the more I learn the more I feel like I don't know and the more I want to know so mm -hmm. I decided that you know probably at the end of my like first year beginning of my second year because it took me two and a half years to finish my bachelor's um I realized nutrition was the way that I wanted to go and then I had to start taking all these chemistry classes because you know silly me I thought nutrition I love to cook by the way I love to experiment and in the kitchen and, and try new things I thought I was just going to get to talk about food a lot, and mm -hmm. I had no idea how much chemistry there was. <laughs> We're everywhere. Yeah. In fact, I can remember my first, I made the mistake of taking general chemistry one in six weeks and general chemistry two in six weeks. <laughs> Multiply the suffering. Yeah. But over a shorter time. And uh, I had a break in between my lecture and my lab, and I remember the first day I sat in my car, I think I even cried. I called my dad. <laughs> I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I was like, this is like a foreign language to me. But it's amazing because I really thought it was something I wasn't going to be able to do. And I persevered and I pushed through it. And I ended with a good grade. You know, I just wanted to see. I ended up with a B in general chemistry and, and then an A in lab and so forth. And, 
you know, every semester I was like, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. And I would get through it sometimes. And I would just, and then I feel like I didn't learn anything. And then when you move to the next class, you realize that, okay, maybe I did learn more than I thought I did. And now it's cool because I see chemistry. <laughs> it's haunting me. We're never going to leave you. <laughs> um, that's one interesting, interesting thing that you said, besides everything else you said, um, is it just persevere, just try. Yeah. You'll, you'll be surprised at what you can do if you just put a little bit of effort into it. I mean, to get an A, you put a lot of effort into it, obviously. Right. But just just try, and you'll find out it's not as bad as you think it is. It's hard, but it's not as it's not undoable. You don't make it undoable. No, um, I appreciate things more now, too, that I have to work hard for. So I, I have a funny story about school. I had uh, a teacher in, I think it was biomechanics. Mm -hmm. And the first biomechanic lab report I wrote back, and I'm generally speaking a good writer, and so the the first lab report I got back, I got a pretty terrible grade, and I was floored, but I was kind of excited at the same time because I'm like, cool, because for so long I was just always getting good grades on papers for English for writing and stuff like that that I found myself slacking off a little bit, not not slacking off. I would still try hard, but I wouldn't proofread as closely. You know, I would just write it and then turn it in, write it and turn it in. And mm -hmm. so it was kind of refreshing to have somebody be like, hey. Right. Challenge you a little bit. Yeah. And so I, I enjoy the challenge like that. I like to be That's good. challenged. All right. What I'm doing, in case I'm looking to make okay. sure that we're not losing um, quality. Yeah, I'll just say quality for now. Well, not too much. No, no, no. It's more with <laughs> the video syncing up with the, with the audio. And sometimes the computer will start to Go crazy and it'll get junk, like the movements will get mm -hmm. really uh, jerky. Choppy. But the, the volume, the sound will keep going as if nothing's going wrong. Mm. So it's, I gotta keep, I keep looking over like that <laughs> in case you wonder what I'm doing. Um, I mean, is it over yet? Yeah. No, no, no. I'm having a great time. I hope you are too. Yeah. Um, I just gotta keep an eye on things because if things get going a little bit too crazy, this computer will get really hot and then this fan will turn on and that's when things start to get jittery. Cool. So I just gotta keep an eye on it. We're good. I mean, you can see that. And now, it overthinks. You can see the CPU like, there. It says CPU percentage is 75% or 57%, so we're good. Okay. It gets to be 90. We may have to turn it off and come back and start again. Hopefully that won't happen. Knock on wood. See, we're telling you all how the sausage gets made now. Um, so here you are. You're at Broward. You finish your course. You finish all your courses. You go on to do your undergraduate at NOVA. Yes. So you got an undergraduate degree from NOVA, bachelor's in science. In exercise and sports science. And so the my last two semesters at NOVA, or my last, so it was the summer going into my last year, I realized that, one, I wanted to get more after my bachelor's. Mm -hmm. I needed more. Uh, Dr. Antonio has been very great as far as impressing on all of us that do research within the importance of education and continuing your mm -hmm. education past your bachelor's. He's always sending stuff out. There's a woman, or a gentleman, I think, that's like 80 when she got her PhD. Mm -hmm. He sent that to all of us. Yeah, good for her. <laughs> he was like, here. That's and we're inspiring. Like, okay, we get it. You know? um, and so I realized that if I wanted to do a master's in nutrition or really in anything, because he also, you know, exercise, they have exercise physiology degrees as far as masters are concerned as well. And I was lacking the chemistry background. And so I realized I needed these prerequisites. Mm -hmm. And so nobody said I could take them at Broward, which is great because nobody didn't offer the general one and two back to back. And also a little fearful of not passing, so I thought I'd rather lose my money at Broward than lose my money at that's, that's a, It's a very clever idea. So I thought, you know, if I fail, I'm only out, you know, $500. No. Exactly. No, it's a very clever move because if they're going to take your credit, why not take it here for less money? Right. It and only makes sense. It worked really well, too, with my schedule. I was right. really lucky how, how that worked out. And yeah, so, we offer a lot of sections of general one and two. Organic, we only offer one, usually. And I know that some of the teachers teach at Nova as well. Mm -hmm. So I know like my lab for Dr. Mumari for mm -hmm. her organic one, she was the lab professor I had. I believe she teaches at Nova for certain things. And so, uh, she, she might, I don't, I don't know. And then so it's, right, it's right there, so why not? Whoever I had for general chemistry said that he taught a couple classes at Nova as well. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing. It's just sure. Within just the price. Less cheaper. Yes. Less, less expensive, not cheaper, not cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, so when you Graduate. Well, when you went to the Nova, when you transferred from Broward to Nova, did you feel ready? Yes, I did. Maybe um, sometimes there were some classes that I didn't necessarily feel ready because I, I definitely took things out of order. Um, but Broward, I felt fine in mm -hmm. Broward when you You know, there were certain chemistry classes that, you know, because it had been so long for me since I had taken my 10th grade class in high, in high school. It was the last time I took a chemistry class. Mm -hmm. I think I took one at USF, but I don't remember. 
it. So <laughs> two, two bottles of vodka will do that. Yeah. <laughs> so I obviously didn't learn anything from that. Um, so, but yeah, I definitely felt felt prepared. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, between Broward and Nova, there's a million resources. I I got tutors. I you know had private tutors. I utilized uh, at Nova. They have a learning resource center. I know here they have it. I utilized it both here and at Nova. Um, I was that annoying student that would go to my professors during office hours and say like, "Hey, I need help with this." I, I mean, I had in the beginning it was funny. I was very timid and I didn't want to do that. And then I realized, you know, listen, it's my great. You know, I, I want to make sure I'm understanding this. I want to make sure that you know. So I I became. I think I swear to one of my one of my professors was so annoyed with me coming all the time. <laughs> I would. I'm like, I need. I don't understand. It wasn't me. Was I get it? no. <laughs> It was for statistics, so. Oops. Statistics stinks. <laughs> it's challenging. It's very difficult. It's a lot more than just taking the mean or a median. <laughs> yeah, you would think that I would love math with my dad being a math teacher, and maybe that's why you hate it. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, I mean, just like it. No right. one hates math. Never hate math. <laughs> no. Mm. <laughs> yes, I do. Sorry. Um, okay, so Broward got you ready to go. Yes. You moved into Nova. How many people were in your classes? Because you would have been a third year student at the time. So at Nova, what was really neat is that the class size is relatively small. Mm -hmm. So there's I, maybe my largest class had like 25 people in it. Wow, okay. I had a couple classes that had 10. My labs were even smaller, um, which was, I loved. You really got like hands-on experience. And the other cool thing, so like I was in my major, I was in my concentration. There's, um, let's see, one, two, there's like four main teachers there. And so you have these teachers normally more than once. Mm -hmm. And so you really get to know your teachers. They know you, that you develop a great personal relationship with them. And what's really neat is that each professor, so like Dr. Mocha is all about biomechanics. So she is, I would call her an expert in biomechanics. I mean, that's what her concentration is. Any, most studies that she does at NOVA has to deal with biomechanics. Mm -hmm. And then there's Dr. Silver, who is more of like a, a motor learning person and knows things in that area, also biomechanics, very knowledgeable in biomechanics. Dr. Antonio is very knowledgeable in sports nutrition aspect of it. And so they each have different, they all are exercise science, but they have their own little niche in exercise science. And so really you have the opportunity to kind of explore each avenue and figure out like what's for you. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Peacock does a lot of training with like fighters and so exercise physiology and program design, strength and conditioning. He's really knowledgeable in that. So, you know, guys that want to be strength and conditioning coaches, I know they would take like the strength and conditioning class. Mm -hmm. Um, and that part was really neat. I appreciated the fact that, like at Nova, I got not only hands-on experience, so any lab, the their exercise science lab is really cool. You can do a lot of different things in it. So they teach you how to do, you know, the typical take blood pressure, do body fat composition test or body composition testing with. There's like the calibers where you get to like pinch really like pinch somebody really hard to like you know measure that, take all the measurements down. They have bot pod dexas. Most people are familiar with the pinch test. Thank yes. you. <laughs> I don't want the number. Um, and so that part was really neat. So I, I definitely, and I got to know the kids in my class, which was, I didn't know that. So funny story, my first class, my first semester at Nova, I met this really nice girl. And I just remember at USF, one thing I do remember is that like the classes were really huge. And so mm -hmm. the chances of you, even at Brock, the chances of you having classes with somebody again, mm -hmm. Um, two semesters in a row is pretty rare unless you're like really good friends with them or maybe as you get into like the chemistry classes and, and less people are taking right. those classes so as far as general education goes the chances of you having two classes with somebody are, are slim to none mm -hmm. so I didn't know that and so it was my first semester at Nova and this girl was super friendly she became my friend we studied together and after the semester you know we parted ways and I remember she invited me to I think it was like a baby shower or something and I didn't go I don't think I even responded because I thought like, oh, she's just trying to be nice. And, like we're never going to see each other ever again. I had every class, <laughs> every semester, Oops. we had a class together. And I, you know, and I used to joke with her. I said I had no idea that we would be friends. I didn't know that we'd mm -hmm. see each other again. I was used to like a large school where like you know you don't see it. So what I I loved about Nova is you know getting to know everybody. Mm -hmm. I also realized too is that. You, you have to put yourself out there. So a lot of the opportunities that I've had is, is because I've, one, not said no when I've been asked to do something. 
I had a professor say, like, you know, the students that get asked to do something are the ones that always say yes. Mm -hmm. And that stuck with me. So when somebody would ask me to, you know, show up for a data collection or show up for a poster presentation, you know, part of me didn't, I I wouldn't say didn't want to do it, but like was nervous about doing it. And my first reaction would obviously would be the same no, you know, but I would always say yes. No matter how scared I was, sure. and then I would show up, and it would be fine. It normally was not nearly as bad as I think that. Right. Right. So. What's the barrier to entry? I'm the same way. I'm like, I'm a, right. Then I get there. I'm like, oh, I'm glad I did that. Yeah. It's yeah. It's one of those things. It's just I don't know, maybe an insecurity people have. I'm not sure. I, well, I think part of it's the fear of failure and sure. the fear of of not knowing exactly. Well, mm-hmm. for me, because I felt that you know a lot of my peers had a lot more education than I am and were more right. knowledgeable than I was, so sometimes I was a little nervous because of that. But I realized that it's totally okay to say I don't know. Right. In fact, it's much better to say I don't know right. than try to finesse an answer. That's, yes, because someone asks me, they know a lot more than you. Yes. <laughs> That's so. I keep we're gonna. Keep going here. I want to get this uh, sequentially. Okay. But I like how you keep talking, but don't worry about that. Um, so you went to NOVA, got a degree, Bachelor of, bachelor of Science yes. in uh, Exercise and Sports Science. Exercise and Sports Science. And then you went into the graduate program to get a master's degree. I'm just starting the graduate program. So you're just starting it now. Yes. So you have you taken any classes yet? Biochemistry. So you took it over the summer? Yeah. Taking it now. I'm taking it now. Taking it now. Yes. What's biochemistry like? It's terrible. <laughs> it's hard, isn't it's it? It's really interesting because so right now, what I'm learning uh, and what I'm about to be tested on is like glycolysis. It's the things that are very interesting to me are the things that are very pertinent to like what I'm learning mm-hmm. in sports nutrition. All that other stuff, which I'm sure is very interesting to other people, mm-hmm. it's almost more challenging if it's not something I'm as interested. In. Right. So like right now, sure. like learning about the citric acid, the TCA cycle, glycolysis, what happens with pyruvate, all that stuff. It's really really interesting to me it's still challenging mm-hmm. but it's much more to easier to apply myself to something that's challenging that i'm interested in than something that's, right you know yeah when i was learning like did we did oh sorry genetics or something that was this. i think it's i think we're let me just uh, try this we'll edit this part out ladies and gentlemen i forget the, i knew i forgot something i knew i forgot something I don't like being shoveled. Makes for fun. Keeps us on our toes. Just forget to delete the old files. So far. Yes, you can. Mm-hmm. There we go. Gotta have that back up just in case. Just in case everything goes wrong. A little more. Okay, so we're, we're still recording here. Everything's good? Right, good. So, biochemistry, so it is hard, right? Yeah, I tell it's everyone it's hard. Everyone's like, oh, no, it's just organic chemistry of the body. Well, true, but it's still really hard. I, well, I think also, and I don't know how true this is, but it's it's a different type of part than organic chemistry. Mm-hmm. I feel like I struggled more with organic chemistry than I did with bio, or than I am with biochemistry. Mm-hmm. Although it's, you know, like I see certain things, I'm like, well, yeah, I'm not an organic <laughs> Like yes, good for me. You know? I, I try. I try really hard. <laughs> so, but you know, that's like some people prefer general chemistry over organic chemistry. Is from what I've heard. Some people like the equations, crunching mm-hmm. numbers. Other people like the, I, I don't know, the organicness. The, 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 the organicness. Yes. The, 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 the mechanisms and such. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Some people are more uh, mathematical. Some people are more visual. Mm-hmm. So, people, like, I'm more of a visual learner. I I don't I I can learn by reading, of course. I can learn by hearing. But I'm more learned by seeing. That's been a little bit of a challenge with the online part mm-hmm. of it. So YouTube has become my best friend, and I there's some doctor 
I think his name is Fern. He's the guy from Oregon State. He videotapes all his biochemistry lectures. Mm, nice. So I follow him and I watch his videos. And then there's another guy, and I don't know his name, and his lectures are a little bit more condensed and broken down. Instead of doing a whole lecture, he just breaks it down into piece by piece. Mm. And he makes it like really easy to understand as well. So by the time I read and then watch two videos, I have a small idea of what's going on. <laughs> it is. That's, well, that's what it takes. It's very, biochemistry is very complicated. All chemistry is complicated, biochemistry, and there's so much. Mm -hmm. It's complicated and there's a lot. If they're just talking about one reaction, that one reaction is not really that complicated. Right. But when you couple it with 15 others and you got to memorize them all, it's like, oh. <laughs> well, and the whole nutrition, seeing all the science that goes into mm -hmm. it. So I'm a certified sports nutritionist. I wow. have to take a test. Funny, okay, so funny thing about the test. Uh, the ISSM, which is the International Society of Sports Nutrition, they've been around for 15, 20 years. Relatively, sports nutrition is relatively new. Mm -hmm. In fact, at, when I was at the conference a couple weeks ago, they gave a Lifetime Achievement Award to somebody, and he stood there and said, you know, when I said I wanted to study, you know, sports nutrition, people told me, don't lose my time. You know, now it's today. It's, it's the degree to have. It's booming. So I... Dr. Antonio said, you know, you can take the certification at Nova. You have to take a nationally recognized certification in order to graduate. Mm -hmm. So you can do personal trainer, you can be exercise physiologist, you can be sports nutritionist. And so the sports nutritionist is pretty difficult, you know, and it's, I think, 180 questions, two hours. And so I remember there was a, a fellow girl that I researched with. Her name's Victoria. She's also the one doing the paddling from Cuba to U.S. So Cuba to what? Yes. She's paddling from Cuba to Key West on a paddleboard to break a world record. She's going from Cuba to Key West yes. on a paddleboard. Yes. She knows the ocean's deep, but does no one yeah. tell her that the ocean's I mean, deep and, and full of sharks? Sharks and jellyfish. And <laughs> Why don't you pull it out? Let's see. Let's pull up the distance between here. And... So we're going to get back to what you're talking about, though. That's kind of her, fascinating. To her me. thing is, I think she even has a website. So it, it's more than 90 miles what she's doing. Because normally it's 90 miles from the southernmost tip, you know, in the mm -hmm. U.S., where they have a thing that. Everyone stands next to mm -hmm. mile um, zero. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, that first one. Top. Yeah. So it's 100 to 120 miles. On a paddleboard. On a paddleboard. So this is. That's Victoria. You can. So, so, she so this is your friend. Yet. She's doing it on her own. Yeah. So it's not like a group of people that are doing it together. No, she's doing it by herself. There's a boat that's following her. But she is a fellow student of mine. So she's currently getting her PhD in exercise physiology. So she's at Nova with you? Yes. Uh, well, she does her research at Nova. She does her PhD program somewhere else, and okay. then she does her research at Nova. Because, so, wow, she's got a statement here. I know. It's insane. Have you ever tried paddleboarding? Uh, <laughs> no, actually, I've never done paddleboarding. I've done sailing and windsurfing, but not paddleboarding. It's a little bit more challenging. So when we were at the conference together, she was obviously still training. Mm -hmm. And a friend of hers had brought some extra boards. And so she invited me to go paddle boarding with her. And I said, sure. I said, I, I've been on a paddle board before. And she said, well, these are, are race boards. So there's different types of paddle boards. Oh, wow. I didn't know. So the one that I went on was relatively wide. This, well, we're, well, we're here before we run. Is there a photograph of her besides Mr. Backer? Um, we'll give her a little bit of props here. I don't know. Are you in the I there's somewhere. No, I guess not. I guess she doesn't. She doesn't. It's not about her. It's about the paddleboard. Maybe that's her surfing. Yeah, she she does surf. She's sponsored by Roxy. Um, that looks terrifying. I know. Like that looks really scary. Well, my my question is, well, what are you what are you going to eat? Because this is going to take anywhere from twenty four to thirty hours. Is she going to get off the board? She eats on the board, from what I understand. Now there's a boat following her. So they can hand her things, but they have to stay within so many feet in order to abide by the Guinness Book of World Records because she she finishes it in thirty hours. That that's the limit that the Guinness Book of World mm -hmm. Records put. No one's paddled, no female at least has paddled from Cuba to Key West, but you know they don't want someone to take like three days to do it. So wow, they they gave her a time limit of thirty hours. That's that's insane. I, I just look at that. I'm terrified. I know. I mean, I like the ocean, but that. That's that's a big wave. And you're standing. I mean, she's obviously not going to sleep for 26 hours. Wow. So has she done like uh, um, high endurance paddleboarding before? Like yes. 
So she's done paddleboard racing before. She did something in Hawaii that I know is a, a long distance paddle as well. She's been training for this, obviously. Sure, uh, a couple absolutely. weeks ago, she did her first like twelve hour paddle. Wow. Um, she said remarkably she wasn't super sore the next day. I mean, it's just amazing. First off, it's challenging. Mm-hmm. Pad- like I thought paddleboarding, okay, like maybe my arms will get tired from like paddle. Your quads are on fire from like being in like a semi crouch position because you're trying to like keep your balance. Your, you know, anything in your abs, at your side, your middle, everything on fire from contracting because you're trying to like keep your balance i mean i'm a newbie so like i was pretty terrible at it but like my whole body was like ah, trying to like frightening me i'm not even doing this crossing i'm terrified here well that's pretty fascinating well, so for she's her. a pro and she's one of the you know great friends i've made through going mm-hmm. to school and doing research so there's a group of us that you know do a lot of the sports nutrition that work under dr antonio doing a lot mm-hmm. of the research and data collection that's that's really interesting. So, that's a friend you've made it know. Is she is she yeah. ahead of you or in the same year as you? She's way ahead. Okay, she's a PhD student or master? Yes. Well, good for her. We'll have her on the show too. The two of you can come on. No, she I'm at I'm at the end. Everyone else is. I'm the the last person. The other two girls that I've made good friends with. One is finishing her master's in public health, and the other one is finishing her master's in nutrition. Mm-hmm. So they they just changed. To be a, a registered dietitian, you used to only need a four-year degree, and then you have to do like ten months of rotations or what they call it, like a dietetic internship. And starting, I think, in two thousand twenty, you'll need your master's to oh, okay. become a registered dietitian. Oh, a lot more. Yes. So, you back to you. Um, you took the exam to become certified as a sports nutritionist. Yes. Okay. So. She and I were studying for it to be together. Mm-hmm. And you need to have um, either be in the last year of your bachelor's or have a minimum of a bachelor's to sit for the CISSN. They have a lower level one called the ISSN, I think, um, or ISSS. They have lots of initials. So <laughs> we were studying for the CISSN, and, you know, it was challenging. And, you know, now that I'm learning more in biochemistry, uh, I understand better what I knew before, but now I really understand. You know, the more you learn something through repetition, the, the, I don't know, the more I get it. Things like light bulbs go off. And I'm like, oh, I get it now, you know? So we were studying and we were really worried because you know, we had the opportunity to take the test. And he sent a link over and he said, here, you know, I've opened a practice exam for you guys. You take the practice exam. This is the story of my life because this is like a one-time shot to take the real thing. Um, it's are expensive. And I'm like a broke college kid. So I'm not a kid, but I'm a broke college student. I understand. <laughs> So me not reading the email completely through, and sometimes I just read things really quickly. I just see like, oh, like practice exam. So I'm at work, and I decide to log on on my work computer, log into it, and just click on the first link that I see to take the test. And you know, it's a time test, and I'm not really paying attention that much because I'm like, oh, it's just a practice exam. The phone's ringing, you know. Like I haven't fully studied. I've only like half studied my note cards, you know, and so. I you need a seventy or higher to pass. So I got a sixty nine, and I'm like, this is great. When I go to take the real thing, right. this means like my studying is working. I'm like really excited. So you know, send my score over to Doctor Antonio, and I was like, you know, keep in mind that you know my phone was ringing eight million times. I had to like get up from the desk and like go unlock a door for somebody. You know, I'm like really happy with the sixty nine, and his email back like, why did you take the real exam? <laughs> And I'm, I said, what do you mean? Like, Why did you take the real exam? Like, That's awesome. And I was like, I was devastated because then I had to pay to you know, take this test. And so now I was like super, I was like, I want to take it right away. You know, mm-hmm. not at work with a you know, million phones. Ringing. So I, I took it later that weekend at home, peace and quiet, mm-hmm. really focused. And I ended up, I think, with an 83. Nice. It would have been so, so funny if you passed it. Though. I know. First, that would have been awesome. So, so what do you what do you kind of learn about when you learn about sports nutrition? So there's we learn about different supplements. There is a couple different things that were part of the ISSN. They were divided or the CISSN. They were di- divided into different categories. So like body composition was one, uh, sports nutrition supplements, exercise physiology. It's funny. So the stuff that involved a lot of the biochemistry is the stuff that I scored the lowest on. And then I'd be interested to take it again now that I, you know, understand things a little bit better with the biochemistry background to see if I would 
do better. But I did pass. Them. That's what's important. That so important. we study different things. I mean, there's so many different areas of sports nutrition because what you it's not only what you put into your body. It's not only about the food. It's you know supplements. Supplements are not always a bad thing. You know, there's a big school of thought out there that like oh you don't need certain supplements if you're eating correctly you can get everything you know from your food which is probably true for like an average person like us you know but for like an endurance athlete somebody that's trying to shave you know seconds off their time or you know lift it one extra pound like to us like okay cool it's like a, a shorter half a second or what's an extra pound but like for you know professional athletes that half a second can win the race that's mm -hmm. what wins them the gold medal you know so there are a lot of different supplements out there that can really enhance your performance um you know we always say people are you know doing nutrition either to perform better look better or feel better so mm -hmm. it's either you know you're trying to be better or you're aesthetically trying to change the way that you look and there's no wrong or right answer to that you know i uh we always joke, I like to think that I'm an athlete. Um, <laughs> but awesome. ultimately, I carry the gene, though. They did a cool gene study at our school about the, I can't think of the, it's a lot of initials right now. But this a, this a gene says that if you're, like, predisposed to being, like, in endurance or strength. And so mm -hmm. you can either be a carrier or you can have both. Um, or you can have, not that you can have, like, a recessive. Gene. So there's a gene that says this person should be a good athlete. Yes, there's an, a, wow. an obesity gene as well. So it's I believe that one's called the FTO gene, mm -hmm. and so that says now anything that's in your genes, your environment can always overcome it to a certain extent. So like the FTO gene, you know, if you have it, you're predisposed to being overweight. That doesn't mean you know you can't change your environment, change your eating habits and combat that. But mm -hmm. certainly if you're not careful and you're just doing whatever, then you're, you're more inclined to gain weight than somebody that's not. Mm -hmm. So so if you have the, like a person comes to you saying they're already an athlete, say they're, they play hockey, say they're a professional hockey player, they play okay. for the Panthers, and they want to get their uh, red line to red line uh, time down to from 10 seconds to 9.8. Or say nine. What would you advise them to do if they're already have a good workout regimen? Well, there's different things that you can take. Ca caffeine is the best. Caffeine not only gets every. Did you hear that? Caffeine is amazing. Caffeine is the best. <laughs> it it's is not a this, crutch. In fact, I'm gonna look at my phone for this really quick so I can tell you they just did released a study on caffeine. I don't know how to project that up there. Oh, uh, what's the name of the study? Um. It's like they do these cool little info memes, but they're not memes. They're all about science. Which sucks at the bottom. Um, so that's the person who posted it. So okay. you could try try Grosso, G R O S S O G. Grosso Ology? No, the space G. I think this is the author. At L, 2017. Okay. So the result is that coffee is associated with a lower risk of breast, colorectal, and endometrial, and prostate cancers. And so this actually has nothing to do with the sports nutrition aspect of it, but coffee's good for you. Coffee's good for you. Yeah, you know, some people say coffee's bad and, you know, end your life, but it's mm -hmm. not. This shows you that. There are decreased risks of certain things with coffee. Decreased risk of Parkinson's disease, type 2 diabetes, and an increased rate, rate risk of pregnancy loss. Which is probably why they tell you not to drink it. Oh, well, it makes sense. The Victoria Meat Outcomes Examine has looked at coffee is associated with the rise of serum lipids. That's not good. But this result was affected by significant heterogeneity. The people that were predisposed to having. Right, have a problem. Interesting. Well, I know, like, um, you were telling me when, when. Oh, I didn't even put up on here. Oops, sorry, everyone back at home. Um, is it? Caffeine's great for endurance. Maybe this will try this. It helps shuttle 
Um, so normally when you're, it depends on the energy system that you're using. Mm -hmm. So if you're sprinting or you're using the ATP PCR system or in endurance athletes, you're using more of the aerobic mm -hmm. energy system. And so with caffeine, it helps when you're using the aerobic energy system, you normally burn through like your carbs first and then you turn into your fat. And so caffeine has, and I don't know the exact mechanism for it, but it has this way of kind of shuttling your system and like preserving your carbs and you burn a little of your fat first, saving mm. some of your carbs as well. Uh, beta alanine is another great one. It lowers the pH level in your muscles and so it allows you to perform faster. So let's take a pause right there because I want to ask you about beta alanine. Because I have done a little uh, personal experiment. The tingles? Uh, the, the tingles, no, it itches. Yeah. Like it itches really badly. The ears, the back of your arms, and Some the neck. Some people like that. <laughs> I have, that scared me. I was like, I'm going to die. So the correct dosing for beta alanine is normally anywhere from 3 to 6 milligrams, which is not much. Mm -hmm. uh, you can find it a lot in pre-workouts. Mm -hmm. um, it's also, I think the itching comes, I'm not quite sure what the itching comes from. I assume it was an allergy. <laughs> I no, don't know. it's common. Every a lot of people feel it. Okay. There's an actual name for it, para something. Okay. And, and am I gonna die? No, you're not gonna die. Okay. Phew. I, I took the I won't say the name of the supplement I take, the pre workout mm -hmm. uh, drink I take. I've told you before. Remember what I told you? you Maybe. Don't, I don't want to say it on my podcast because okay. they're not paying me. Um but it uh had beta alanine and I was like, Okay, yeah, beta alanine, fine. I'm not sure how much there is. So I take the full dose, the little little thing, that, and uh, within a half, maybe 20 minutes, mm -hmm. I couldn't stand my own skin. It was terrible. So the first poster presentation that I had the opportunity to do at Nova was the effects of pre-workout supplementation on mood, strength, and endurance. Mm -hmm. And so it was a double-blind crossover trial. And they were randomly selected to either be in the pre-workout group or the placebo first. And so what everybody did is they came in and either took the pre-workout or the or the placebo. Mm -hmm. And then and the pre-workout had beta alanine in it, had creatine in it, and it had caffeine in it. Mm -hmm. And the placebo had caffeine in it. Caffeine only. Caffeine okay. only. So then they waited 30 minutes. And it was funny because if you've never taken pre-workout before, then you don't really know what to expect. But those of us who have taken pre-workout before... We would be like, oh, I, th I think I got the, the real one. You don't know what you're getting. Mm -hmm. So you know, you're like, I think I feel tingly, but I'm not 100% sure. Because sometimes some people don't feel tingly. Sometimes it takes a lot to feel tingly. It's, it's really dependent on the person. So they would take it. 30 minutes later, we'd have to do a POMS personality test because we wanted to see if they affected their mood. And then they would do um, one rep max bench press to see like what their their one rep max was, how like heavy they could lift. And then after they we determined their one rep max, we had them do eighty percent of their one rep max. So if they did a hundred pounds as their one one rep, then they did eighty pounds to failure. And so we counted like how many reps till failure it was. And that was a way of measuring muscle endurance. So the one rep max measured measured the muscle muscular strength and then the reps to failure did the endurance. And then a week later, they came in again, and they took the opposite of whatever they took the first time, and then the same protocol. Waited 30 minutes, took the personality test, did the one rep max, and then did the reps to failure. Mm -hmm. And oddly enough, there was no big difference in strength, no big difference in personality either, because we thought that people would be, you know, sometimes when you take free workout, have you ever taken it and not find a workout because something happened before? No, I'm very careful about that. It's terrible. I would think I don't want to be all wired up. Because like, you're like wired, right. you're like ready to go, and then you have to like sit there, you know. Right. And so we thought for sure that like some form of agitation or something would change in the personality test. And no, but there was a difference in endurance. Now it could be it definitely helps with endurance. There could have been a difference in strength had they been using it every day because beta alanine and creatine take uh, what they call a waiting period. So for you to feel the true effects of beta alanine and creatine, you have to be using it regularly for about two weeks before. What do you mean by regularly? Like every day. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you really, because I'm taking it just before I work out and only when I feel like I need it. Well, it, it in terms of endurance and better workout, it's certainly going to help you. Mm -hmm. But in terms of like actual strength gains, you would need it. So there's a difference between muscular strength and muscular endurance. So strength being like the most weight that you could push in one rep, endurance, how many reps can you continue to go without okay. stopping? Well, I, I can say just from my own personal experience that uh, endurance, mo most definitely I have more endurance, but I also 
but I wasn't sure if it was the um, the caffeine just making me feel like I had more endurance, that I just feel better, or if it was actually something more biochemical going on. No, caffeine de definitely works for endurance. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of research on that. Um, in fact, Victoria, who's doing the crossing, we were talking about, so when should I drink my caffeine? You know, should I drink it as I like, start to get tired? Should mm -hmm. I drink it when it's dark out? Because my body's naturally going to want to go to sleep because it's dark out, but I'm going to have to keep paddling in the dark. Terrifying with the sharks. And yeah, like this. A little, a little scary there. <laughs> no, but also there is a certain, I don't know if you want to call that like a psychosomatic. There's always, you know, if it makes you feel better and you're having a better workout, mm -hmm. then take it. You know, I, I'm a big, same with diet too. There's so many different diets out there right now. and there, There's no right or wrong diet per se. Um, I mean, there are certainly certain things that you can do that are incredibly harmful, but, mm -hmm. you know, is ketogenic the, the smartest? Because that's a bad right now, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to do ketogenic. Is it the smartest thing to do? Well, I mean, if you're predisposed to like high blood pressure and high cholesterol, then probably no, you shouldn't right. be eating like tons of fat. Does it work as far as dramatic changes in body composition? Absolutely. There are studies that show that, you know, people on a ketogenic diet do have changes in body composition. Mm -hmm. Also studies that show that it's not so great for performance. But at the end of the day, if you can't adhere to a ketogenic diet, then there's no point in doing it. Right. You know, if you can't, if that's not how you like to eat, if you're a vegetarian, you probably shouldn't do it. You have a hard time with ketogenic diet. Yeah, you diet. probably shouldn't do a ketogenic diet. Why don't you uh, explain for the people out there that may not know what you're, you're referring to with the ketogenic diet? So the ketogenic diet is the thought that you should be eating primarily fat and very little carbs and very little protein. So the idea is when your body has run through all its glycogen stores, you have nothing left but ketones to burn for energy. And actually at a resting rate in your fasted state, your body does tend to use ketones for energy as well as the stored glycogen stores. Um, but if you have nothing but fat and just enough glucose, because when you eat carbohydrates, it gets mm -hmm. turned into glucose, just enough glucose to keep your brain going. Um, the idea is that your body turns to stored fat to burn for, for energy. To keep your body alive and move it. Some people love it. Some people say they feel really great. Um, some people don't like it. There are studies that have shown, and I can't name the study off the top of my head, but there are some studies that have shown for people with like epilepsy, mm -hmm. it's super helpful. Some people have, at the conference, they were talking about how it could be possibly helpful for people that have concussions. Really? Um, not sure the mechanism behind that. Uh, but, you know, also for athletes that are normally people that get concussions, asking them not to eat for a day and then switch over to a ketogenic diet isn't always it's just more doable. Right. And there's also things to take into consideration. So we have like all this bacteria in our gut that's like really good for us. We have some bad bacteria as well. So when you're essentially eliminating a food group, which in turn normally helps you like create a calorie deficit. Um, you're also eliminating some of the good bacteria that you get. So right. if you do decide to do ketogenic, then, you know, you should definitely take maybe a prebiotic or a probiotic to, you know, keep everything healthy in your stomach. Um, a study that was just done on low-carb versus low-fat diets at the uh, for a year. I can't imagine doing either diet for an entire <laughs> year. That's probably, probably the hardest thing is to get people to actually adhere to these yes. things. Um, so the study showed at the end of the year, there was no significant difference between the low carb and the low fat diet as far as body composition. And the low carb lost six kilograms overall, the low fat on average lost 5.3 kilograms. So nothing that was considered statistically significant. Right. So the moral of the story is do what, you know, what you're going to adhere to. Mm -hmm. um, also, another big myth out there, which I've learned a lot about, is protein. So everybody thinks that, well, not everybody, but you know, you hear some people say like, you know, oh my gosh, protein's so great. And then other people are saying, don't eat too much protein, it's bad for your kidneys. Um, it's with anything. I think any diet is going to be tailored to like what your needs are and like where your health is at and what your primary goal is, aesthetics, health, or performance. Um, but certainly in resistance trained individuals, a high protein diet and we're talking about, you know, anywhere from two to three times the, the recommended daily amount isn't harmful in kidneys. So we did a study for specifically actually on women. So for six months, these women ate anywhere from like 1.8 to 2.2 kilograms of 
for grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. So right now, the recommended daily value or daily um, recommendation of protein is 0.8 grams per kilogram. Oh, wow. Okay. So for me, for instance, I was eating roughly like 200 grams of protein a day. I got to be a few. It's another thing. You could be a part of these studies. It's so much fun. So we measured our body composition and also we used a DEXA scan to measure bone mineral density. Women are normally more predisposed to you know osteoporosis or the one that's sort of precursor to that. Mm-hmm. And so we measured bone density. And so it didn't have any effect on our bone density. In fact, some people improved their bone density. Oh, really? interesting. Months. Um, but everybody was resistant to training and everybody mm-hmm. was currently, you know, exercising. So that could be, you know, another, if you have low bone mineral density, if you exercise, that's a way of actually strengthening mm-hmm. your bone. Well, it's long. So the more impact that your bones get, the stronger they get. Mm-hmm. Um, but just, you know, something that was very interesting. They also did um, a year-long study for protein on both men and women. And, I mean, some of these men really, because I mean, boys can eat a lot more than girls. Although there are some girls that can really out-eat the, the men in our peanut butter study remind me to tell you about the one girl. <laughs> so, you know, some of these guys were eating three, 400 grams of protein a day. And um, oddly enough, when you over feed on protein, you would think that you're going to gain weight. But for the most part, the body composition between the two groups remain the same. If maybe not, some of them even improved over the course of a year. Mm-hmm. Now, could it be because they're more mindful of the way that they eat? And, uh, you know, once again, you're eliminating other not eliminating completely other food groups, but when you're spending so much time on one food group, something else has got to give. Really you know, you've got to decrease the fat, decrease the carbs somewhere. You know, mm-hmm. so there's a, a bunch of different ideas on why you know an increased protein can you know lead to better body composition. Some people say it's the thermogenic effect of protein. Then there's also tell us, non. Tell us a little bit about that thermogenic effect. So when you eat protein, your body actually burns calories to digest it. Interesting. So, and there's different theories on why that happens. Some people, actually, drawing a blank right now, but there's a couple different theories on why your body burns more calories to digest protein. Um, Another thought or school thought was that maybe eating more protein increased your non exercise energy thermogenesis. So, like, you you fidget more, maybe because you eat more protein, you're active, or it's because you're active and eat more protein. Mm -hmm. You know, like, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Sure. Uh, so the recent poster presentation that I was able to do at the conference in Clearwater, it was, does high protein diet affect your quality and quantity of sleep? So we had 14 subjects. We all wore these like really dorky looking watches Mm -hmm. and these watches measured everything. I mean, you wore them like 24 hours a day. You you were told not to take them off. They measure your heart rate, your temperature. They, They give you like a lot of different data just from wearing the watch so what we were looking at was sleep quality and quantity and so the watch could tell you about how long it took you to fall asleep um how long did you stay asleep how many times did you wake up in the middle of the night i think i woke up 42 times and i mean they they consider a wake up it could just even be shifting from like rolling over in bed from one side to the other um and then also like how long you slept and we compared that to the first, and this was a relatively short study, so it's the first study of this particular one done. Maybe they'll do more on it. So for the first seven days, you were either in the high-protein group or the normal-protein group, and then in the second seven days, you're in the opposite of what you were the first time. And your goal was to eat double or triple the amount of protein that you ate when you were in the normal. And okay. then we looked at sleep quality. Nothing happened. It, I was... <laughs> Nothing happened in the study that I got to present this this year. <laughs> well, it's good information though, because a lot of people think that you need a lot of meat to get to sleep. Right. Well, we don't know. So seven days is not really a, a good. You know, that's a really short time to really get an accurate, mm-hmm. you know, idea of like how somebody sleeps. Uh, the one thing that we did realize is that we all slept six hours or less, so we were all considered chronically sleep deprived. Oh, okay. There was a very interesting. Uh, study and i'm going to paraphrase it so don't take my word for it but there was a study at the conference about sleep and what they would do in this particular study is they would show people pictures of like a neutral picture so like a pencil or a cup of coffee and then they would show pictures of like something very disturbing maybe like a mutilated body or like a really bad car accident and you would wear this like crazy cap and they would you know, measure the way that your brain reacts to it. So normal people who sleep normal and get like the proper amount of sleep, 
they have a specific reaction to the disturbing picture and they don't have much of a reaction to the neutral picture. Um, oddly enough, psychopaths or sociopaths will have no brain activity to either picture, but they will tell you that the disturbing picture is disturbing, mm -hmm. but there, there's like no brain activity going So they know on. what they're supposed to say. Right. And then for people that were sleep deprived, so the more sleep deprived that people became, the less of a reaction or brain activity that it had to the disturbing picture. So the less sleep that you have, the less, I don't know, even more psycho. Well, I guess that kind of makes sense though, because the less you sleep, the less you sleep, the less you care. Right. And so they don't know. So maybe you just want to go to sleep. Maybe it's an environmental adaptation. Mm -hmm. You know, your body is trained like less sleep. It goes into survival mode. That's another reason why it's hard to lose weight. I mean, your body doesn't want to lose weight. Your body wants to survive. And, and how did it survive back in the day? It held right. on to everything, you right. know? So like it's somewhat against, and this does not mean that it's impossible to lose weight, but it's sometimes against like, nature like mm -hmm. lose weight you know because right. your body views that as like oh god i'm not eating enough i need more i need more food you know i need to like preserve my muscle i need to preserve my fat what's going to happen the next time i'm going to eat you know like all these crazy things that go into uh, right all these biochemical mechanisms to yeah. prevent weight loss <laughs> to prevent fat loss and muscle loss so really if you're keep your brain going you know you could say that you know i have a better chance of surviving if, uh, if only it was four thousand years ago you if, know if, if something <laughs> happens well, that, that's what I, I tell, well, you, maybe you've heard me say this in class, I'll tell my students, it's like, when you look at human beings, we're not, we're just animals. Mm -hmm. You know, at one time you had to fight and survive. You know, if you found food, you grabbed all you could and you ran because you're going to get killed by the tiger who's coming to get the meat too. And uh, the reason why our body holds on to it is because, well, because people who held on to fat survived. to right. have babies. The ones who didn't hold on to fat, who lost weight quick, they got killed by the tiger. Or they got killed. They died of starvation. Yeah, and then, then the tiger got them. You know, you know. It's if you have to remember that we're just we're just an evolutionary animal. You know, all, most animals are the same way. Once they get fat, it's hard to. They don't want to lose it. Right. And they lose it because of, they just can't find food. There is a another paper that was released that talked about people that diet. How a year later they're often back at their original weight, if not mm -hmm. more. Now this one went into levels of leptin which i guess signal that you're hungry um and so after a prolonged period of dieting so when you as your body fat goes down your your body's like a, a thermostat so like here in the air we set the air at 75 mm -hmm. it goes above 75 the air kicks down to bring it back to set or kicks on to bring it back down to 75 and if it goes below then the heat kicks on to get you back up to you know 75 so this one paper theorized that your body was very much the same way. So when you're dieting, you're now falling under and restricting food and going under the, you know, your body's like set point or comfortable point. So when you stop dieting, you're hungry. Mm -hmm. Your body's trying to get back up to its normal. And they theorize it's the same thing if you go over as well. Um, hmm. But it was a very interesting paper. That is interesting. But I mean, as someone who struggled with weight my whole life, I, I can honestly say like diets don't work. Right. I hate the word diet. You, just, you can't, yeah, you can't go on a quote unquote diet. You just have to exercise. Yes. And by exercising, you'll sleep more. When you sleep more, you'll eat less because you're asleep. Yes. You well, know? and if you are, if you get the proper amount of sleep, you're you're less inclined. You think better. I mean, there's mm -hmm. so many studies that yes. show the cognitive aspect of that, sleeping more, so you're more inclined to make a better decision. Your appetite increases if you don't get enough sleep. Yes, it does. And I think that could probably be another environmental, like, need to survive type mm -hmm. thing. Um, there's a lot of benefits of sleep. Sleeping, there is a joke, uh, or not a joke, there's something that said that we at the conference that, like, sleep is one of the best supplements you can take. You know, it's, like, one of the greatest things you can go yes. through your body. And it's largely, mis under, no, not I shouldn't say misunderstood, not understood. We don't really understand what it is. Like In America, we think it's cool that we don't sleep. <laughs> Yeah, we think that's a, a good really? thing that like oh. you're working so much harder than everyone else. We also think multitasking is a good thing. Yeah, I can't get that. Nobody can really multitask. Everyone says they can, but no one really can. You just do both things poorly. Right. Or all three things extra poorly. <laughs> it's like try driving and texting and immediately look at what you're doing. Like, oh, no. You know, you, you can't. You, you can't do both. You do both poorly. You know, you mistype and you kill somebody. I try to do that talk to text sometimes. Well, even that. And that's terrible. Distracting. Well, have you ever? It doesn't always pick up when I say it. Right, so it you auto corrects really you. Text that, like, <laughs> you, start, you start saying the wrong thing to the wrong people. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Uh, sorry, sir. Um, 
one thing I did that we did talk about before and we should maybe touch on is the uh, intermittent fasting diet. And so I think for me that actually works really well. I I like I like intermittent fasting. Um, you know, there are some studies that show so there's a study that shows that intermittent intermittent fasting and resistance training together resulted in a greater change in body composition than intermittent fasting alone. Can we stop for a second and can you explain exactly what is resistance training? Lifting weights and exercising. So what would be the, so there's resistance training and what's another kind of training? Well, resist endurance training. Cardio, so, that, so that would so be like, like cardio, cardio, like spin bike, running, running jogging, bike, walking. Right. Uh, resistance training would be weights, medicine balls, uh, kettlebells, okay. exercise, resistance bands, obviously something that shows resistance. And honestly, you, you need a little of both. It's really not like all all strength training and all cardio, you know, or all cardio. It's not this all or nothing thing. You know, you mm -hmm. definitely need the resistance training to keep your muscles in shape and to exercise your muscles, but you also need the cardiovascular endurance. You know, you, you want to make sure your heart is healthy. Mm -hmm. um, both are good. Now, obviously, if you're an athlete, you're going to train specific to your sport, but, you know, elite runners still lift weights. You know, endurance athletes still lift weights. Um, well, that's why with the elite runner, the Canadian Ben Johnson, who was caught for uh, steroids for building muscle. Oh, and that's what he got caught with. So they and because they they found that when sprinters build muscle, they, they were faster. Well, look at a sprinter's body and look at a marathon. Endurance, marathon right, I mean, they, completely different. They look completely yeah. different. Well, marathon yeah. the sprinters look like. Like they're they're like bodybuilders, body yeah, and they've got those quads that are yeah. just, and the, their shoulders are huge because they're, you know, the, I guess there's a pulling motion when you run. I'm yeah, not, there's a whole not much of a runner. <laughs> a jog. I, I do something <laughs> tank like when I go down the street. Right, I run after the ice cream. Um, <laughs> exactly. No, you know, it's another reason why you want muscle. So as you get older, uh, you you lose some muscle mass. So what happens? A lot of people, you know, they end up in the hospital. If you're bedridden for a while, you know, your body starts to deteriorate from being bedridden. Well, if you don't have any muscle on you, you know, your, your body deteriorates a lot quickly because what's left to deteriorate is your organs and like right. you know, your fat. If you've got, you know, a good amount of, amount of muscle on you and you end up in the hospital, you have a you know, better chance of recovering that. Mm -hmm. It's just exercise is, like you said, it's just, it's good. It makes you feel better. It does. It, it does. makes you feel really good. You sleep better. And there's just so many. There's so much out there today that shows you that people that exercise live longer. Mm -hmm. You know, they live healthier lives. Right. They, you know, more active. More active. And it's fun. You know, people like, it, not everything has to be in the gym. You can go paddle boarding. Right. You, know, right. you, you get can go hiking. Mm -hmm. um, what did I do recently that left me really sore? Uh, oh, I just like right outside. <laughs> but I was pretty sore. Biking can be, it's hard. Yeah. People look at it and go, oh, you're just biking. Well, if you're actually trying to, to work, it's really hard to do. Like, look at these marathon bike guys. They're in, in fantastic shape. Like, I mean, those are obviously the elite bikers, but I spin bike at least four or five times a week. I don't do the whole class. I just get on it and go for 45 minutes. Well, that took me it's six tough. months to get to that point where I could do 45 minutes with moderate resistance. I know. You know, and now, like, now if I don't do 45 minutes, I don't even really feel like I did anything, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but I will say this about exercising, and it's, and I'm not going to lie to the people, <laughs> it sucks. It's not fun. It hurts. You, you feel it. You feel weak all the time, but you sleep like a baby. You do change. Your body does change. And if you work out with, if you do muscle work, like I do a lot of V-sit-ups and all that kind of mm -hmm. crap. I couldn't do V-sit-ups six months ago. My trainer's got me doing them. I, I love you, Amy. Can't stand my trainer. Mm -hmm. uh, she's a really nice lady. If you hate her, then she's a good trainer. She's a great trainer. I hate her. No, I don't hate her personally. I just, like, like I told her I made the mistake. I said, no, Amy, I think cause we do a lot of burst training, like, you know, one minute of hard cardio. Like, like high intensity interval. Yeah. High minute, yeah, exactly. That's what it is. We'll do weights and we'll do more cardio. It was like 45 seconds, 15 second break, 45 seconds, you know, that kind of training. So I think we need to up the, the intervals to maybe do two back to back cardios and two back to back weights. So she comes on Friday. She's like, okay, we're going to do five back to back cardio and five back to back weights. We're going to do that three times. I said two. <laughs> I said two. So she made me do, what was it? This thing she calls uh, shuffle, shuffle, reach. We just shuffle back and forth yep. and reach for the ground. Then after that minute, without stopping or taking a break or taking a heart rate, uh, high knees on the stairs. Okay, fine. I can do those two. It's pretty good. So it's like, now run up and down these stairs for a minute. 
and I can't, I can do it, but I don't like doing so. Right. And then she's like, okay, now we're going to do jumping jacks. And I'm like, for, you know, after the fifth one, I'm looking at her, and I, and I literally, my mind went into a rake. I'm just so angry right now. I, just, I, I held it together because I don't want to yell at Amy because right. she's really a nice lady. But I'm like, I'm just really mad right now because I can't do this. Like, I, I could do it once, but now she's going to make me do it two more times, and I can't do it. I don't have it. And I'm thinking, I ride that bike for 45 minutes every day. Or stop five times a week. That's what it's neat. You can just continually challenge yourself and change the exercise. You sound just like her. You sound just like her. Just a challenge. I, you did it. You were great. I was like, ah! I'm really mad at myself. I don't think I'll do this. But it was, uh, the benefit was, and she's right, and when I calmed down, I could hear it. Um, you couldn't have done this six months ago. Right. And now you did it three times. Yeah, okay, you, you walked for part of it because your heart rate was way up. But you still did it. I'm still as angry though, and myself, not at her. I still get, you know, there's some days where I don't feel like working out, you know. I mean, but I do it. Mm -hmm. I do it because I don't feel bad. I mean, I don't feel like going to work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Same way, you know. Like, well, that's that's the thing about working out. There, once you start doing it, it's it's addictive. Like you like it, you like the feeling. I do anyway. I like the feeling, and I like and I like the fact that I can put on clothes now and they don't feel tight. Right. I like that a lot. Plus, I don't have a bad. My back's not sore. Mm -hmm. I don't feel sore anymore. My feet don't hurt. My knees don't hurt. My hips don't hurt. My muscles sometimes hurt. But I like muscles. Right now. Then I do. We do yoga too. I do yoga once Yoga's a week. Great. I love yoga. I, I love it too. It's hard though. It's harder than people think. It's very challenging. Have you ever tried hot yoga? No, I haven't tried, but I've just done the yoga it's classes okay. here. Okay, so I obviously love high intensity stuff. I love lifting heavy weights. I like running. Well, I don't really. I have a like love hate relationship with running. Uh, it depends on the day. But yoga, yoga is one of those things that I like struggle with. It's hot, first off, the hot yoga class I take. And then I went and when I got there, I did, it was 75 minutes instead of 60 minutes. Someone told me that. I guess they could have looked, looked that up online. But isn't that interesting that the mental part too, though, right? Yeah. Like if you think it's 60 minutes, you go, yeah, okay, okay, I can like, do I it. Can I can do it. Do but those, one more minute, but another you know? quarter of an hour is really only 50 minutes. It's not it's that a long. Deal, it yeah, but it is because mentally you're ready for 60, and then all of a sudden it's 75. Yeah. And then, you know. you know, I'm hot, and, like, my sweat's, like, getting in my eye, and, you know, and I, you know, holding these poses, and in mm -hmm. my head, I'm like, this is so stupid, and, and then I keep going. Because, right, because it's because you feel better. Because I feel better after. I feel taller you know? after I do yoga. I feel, yes, I have, like, a better posture. And then, and then I love, you know, so here's the thing, so then I try to eat stuff that's going to fuel my body to do better in the workout. You know, mm -hmm. I used to, when I was younger, just eat whatever I want, right? Mm -hmm. Now I realize if I eat certain foods and I eat healthy and I stay away healthy-ish, you know what I mean? I still like to live life. Um, I perform better. You know, mm -hmm. so if I'm not eating McDonald's every day, right? My body like recovers better. That's one thing I, I tell people to stay away from McDonald's. I mean, obviously you're, you're you work out a lot, so eating McDonald's is no big deal. No, honestly, they if you like to eat it, but I when I was living in Toledo, um, I would I had a McDonald's literally I'd drive right by one every day, and if I was alone. Going around for to have dinner with, I would stop in there and I would. And this is embarrassing. I would get a Big Mac meal, big, and a cheeseburger meal, like a, a quarter pounder meal, large size again, and I'd eat the whole thing at night. Cookies are my thing. So, yeah. I've been caught in the middle of the night eating cookies. I'm a night eater. But how many? One, two, or the whole bag? Well, sometimes I can eat two. Sometimes I eat a lot. Good for you. Um. Peanut butter, I love peanut butter. Yes, peanut butter is yummy too. In fact, when we did that study on peanut butter, I was like really excited. So we, we had to consume a minimum of four 16 ounce jars of peanut butter in four weeks. Four 16 ounce, that's those are the big jars. Yes. <laughs> so it was, and you, so, and, and you couldn't really adjust your calories. It had to be like, you know, the extra two, 300 calories over what you eat. So I was like, I love peanut butter. Now, this is the natural peanut butter, so it's obviously like not as flavorful as, you know, Justin's almond butter, which is like a $12 jar. But so, you know, right? I love peanut butter. So I, I ate, I think, four and a half, maybe five jars. Wow. I was really proud of myself because I thought I probably ate the best peanut butter out of anybody. And this girl came in, she ate 10 jars of peanut butter. Wow. And I was like, she's a fan. I know. And it's no surprise, everyone. Well, she was spoon feeding it? Yeah, I that's how I eat mine. I eat mine with a spoon. With a spoon? Or I put it in like a, a shake or something. Oh, and a shake. I love peanut butter and shake. Have you ever tried coconut oil in a shake? No. 
Okay, so this is the new thing I've discovered for baking. So I love I love to bake. I stress bake. <laughs> okay. Why I not, stress right? bake. And then if I'm baking like the real stuff, like if I bake real banana bread, real cupcakes, real cookies, I send them to work with Tim and I make everybody at the or I take them to work with me and I make everybody at the office eat them. Mm -hmm. Um but then I like to, you know, experiment with new stuff. So the other day, black bean, I made black bean brownies really good. I've made brownies out of zucchini. I've made them with no flour. So I've used things like almond flour, coconut flour. Um, I've taken black seeds and chia seeds and put them in a food processor so they become really fine and made it with that instead of any almond flour or anything. Um, so my new thing that I discovered, it's called cacao butter. Oh, sure. So mm -hmm. they, the ones that I got came in like little chips and then you melt them down and you can throw them in a smoothie and it adds, even though they, they look like white chocolate and if you eat it, it just kind of tastes like butter mm -hmm. and it doesn't taste very good if you eat it. Although it looks like it tastes really good if you eat it by itself, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, but when you throw it in a smoothie or when you bake with it, it gives that really rich chocolatey flavor. Mm -hmm. And so I've been baking my like black bean brownies or my zucchini brownies with the cacao butter and just a little bit because you need you know some oil in in what you're baking and they come out really good. Wow. But I really try to make only one serving because sometimes they're really good and I want to eat all. Yeah, I'm with you on that. <laughs> let me let me finish my McDonald's my McDonald's store has a happy ending. Oh oh nice pun. <laughs> I lived in I lived in uh, Toledo maybe okay. seven years ago. Seven years ago, I don't know. I moved down to Florida. When I moved here, I said I'm not going to eat any more fast food for for a year. Okay. I just said for one year, no fast food. And I've been seven years. I haven't had McDonald's in seven years. Really? Yeah. Now, have you yeah. had like Burger King or Chick Fil A? No, no fast food. Okay. Uh, I think the last time I went to a fast food restaurant might have been in Chipotle. But does that really count as like fast uh, food? It's probably it's probably worse than McDonald's. I don't know. I went to Chipotle. Then they had the whole scare with E. Coli, and I said I'm okay. I'm done with that too. And uh, yeah, I've had burgers and fries before, but I usually right. go to like a uh, burger stop over here or something like that. I, okay, Burger Stop has fried peanut butter balls. Have you ever? No, but I had their peanut butter burger. I didn't like their peanut butter peanut burger. Peanut butter jelly burger? Yeah. I wouldn't have it twice, but it was good. I could see why it won an award. They have peanut butter that's fried. Mm. And, like, it, and then it comes with these little shots of. Now I don't drink milk. But it, they come with these little shots of what they call cereal milk. So you know when like you're a little kid and you used to eat like your sugary yeah, cereal and like the sweet milk, yeah. the sweet milk. That's what it comes with little shots of those and these fried peanut butter balls with Nutella. And you, it's just like they're the most amazing things. They don't go there if you want if you want to Ever. stick to a calorie reduced diet or what about it's your cheat day or something. Beehive. The milk, Have you heard of beehive, beehive yet? Yeah. Okay, so Beehive is on Cypress and Andrews, Cypress Creek and Andrews, so mm -hmm. it's not too far from here. Mm -hmm. And it's got the same setup, per se, as Chipotle. So you have these, like, bowls, and you, like, move down the assembly line, mm -hmm. and you can pick what you want, except their bases are kale or sweet potato noodles or maybe rice of some sort. Wow, okay. And then your sides are, like, green beans. Broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, mm -hmm. or sweet potatoes, and then you pick the protein, which they have just regular like roasted chicken, and mm -hmm. we have these really good almond chicken tenders, which are probably not as healthy for you as I'd like to believe, but they're really good. And then you can have steak or tofu, mm -hmm. or I think they even have tuna. Wow. And it's really good. Check that place out. That sounds like a yes. good place to try. There's a couple people that are catching on to that trend, mm -hmm. so they're doing a bullicious as one. Um, full way. I don't know. Wow. So, let's talk about fast food then. Okay. Because yeah, um, I think fast food. Is, I mean, obviously, everyone loves fast food. I'm not going to say I don't like. I mean, even to this day, seven years later, I still crave McDonald's. Really? I still crave it. I That's still, okay. I, I crave cookies. Still, all. really, I would love to break down and just go to McDonald's and get a burger and fry, like a big old, and then just just go stupid. But I know once I do that, I'll do it again. Like I'm, I'm a creature of habit that right. way. Like I'm, I'm an ice cream guy. Like ice cream is my weakness, so I don't buy it. I just walk by it in the store because I don't, I don't have a problem not buying it. But once it's in the when house, it's if it's a half gallon, I'm eating a half gallon. Have you tried any <laughs> of the, food, food, food. the other ones, the new healthier ice creams that are out there? Yeah, right my wife, my wife actually bought some last this week, and we had one last night. It was uh, 100 calorie, but it's not ice cream. It's something else because it doesn't even have a 
doesn't taste doesn't have the right mouth feel. Oh, did you the Arctic Zero? Because the Arctic Zero is disgusting. It might be Arctic Zero. Okay. No, it, it actually tasted There's, good. It had a good taste of like butterscotch and something. There's good a better taste. Halo Top. Is it's like 400 calories for the whole pint, but it's 100 calories per serving. Um, and Enlightened has some like really good ones. We have had Enlightened before too. They have maybe grapes too. But I like, uh, I'm not sure what it's called, but it comes in a little clear tub and it's about that big. It's a little screw oh, top. Like yeah, Tolini. Yeah, like that? Yeah. yeah, that stuff is so, sea salt, sea, caramel and sea salt. That's pretty. <laughs> but I, again, I, I try to just avoid it because once you have one, you're going to have 500, you know. Try to be a good boy, but it's hard. But so, do they have better food here in Florida or Toledo? Oh, uh, there's more choices there because it's a bigger city. But Toledo had some really nice restaurants to eat at. Uh, seafood was not as good as here because obviously Toledo's right, an okay. inland, and most of their quote unquote seafood came from a lake. So, I don't know why they called it seafood. Lake food. Like we're having a seafood special. What's what's the seafood? Uh, lake perch. Do you see what the problem? <laughs> do you see do you see the problem there? I mean, I, maybe I'm the only one who sees it. You know. Um, the food here is much better, and the people here is it's a healthier atmosphere because obviously I think because we have a beach, right? Uh, that's readily accessible to all year round. People try to be a little more health conscious because you know who wants to go to the beach and not look at least acceptable. With right? bikini season year long, right? Exactly. So people are a little bit more health conscious, and I think here, believe it or not, is a little bit of a younger crowd. But if, okay. if I took you to Toledo, it's a little bit older, and the younger people that you would see there. Uh, I was overweight, large when I was there. Some people are they're they're extremely obese. It's and they're and they're not even they don't even look happy. They just look miserable. Right. You know, part of that is the climate. Like the climate in the Midwest is, is I'm just gonna say it's terrible. You know, it's either brutal hot or brutal cold. And in the spring and the fall, maybe you have a week of nice weather. You know, whereas here is just brutal hot. Right. You know, okay. um, but but in Michigan, I'll be honest. With Michigan and Toledo, I'll be honest. In the summer, in the, in August. It can get to 110, you know, and stay there for a week or two. In it's Phoenix, brutal. two years ago, they had the ISSN conference in Phoenix. First conference I got to do. And it was in June in Phoenix Ooh. during their, like, record year. <laughs> and it was, I want to say, like, 120 Ooh. degrees. And Florida's hot. Don't get me wrong. But we're, like, humid hot. Right. We're, like, walk mm -hmm. to your car and you're already drenched in sweat. Right. And everyone just accepts it. Yeah. Right. This was like opening an oven. Right. Yeah, stifling heat. And like, oh, I couldn't believe it. The, the dryness makes it so bad. And then it was cool in the evening. Yeah, so that's the interesting about deserts, right? It's, well, cool is comparative, right? Right. It's 92. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but living here is a definitely a lifestyle change. And I, and I enjoyed it. I'm glad I came here. Really, I'm very happy I came here. But. I want to go back if I don't, if you don't mind, because I, I like to talk about intermittent fasting a little bit. Oh, okay. um, I'm sorry, we got to no, we, that's that's cool. It's what the show's all about. Is just just talking about cool stuff. Um, would you explain to people what intermittent fasting is before we move on to talking about it? What what exactly is intermittent fasting? It's miserable. No, no, um, <laughs> it's misery defined. It's not eating for a period of time. So the period of time can be anywhere from you know six, eight, sixteen hours. Sometimes even people do it like whole 24 hour mm -hmm. fasts. Um, there's even religions that do it as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not super educated behind the whole thought process behind it, but a little bit of what I've learned about in biochemistry is that your body's either in a fed or a fasted state and different things go on in either one. So in the fasted state, your body is using more of your food region stores and the ketones to burn fat and nothing's not as many systems per se are turned on as when the fed state is turned on. And now all of a sudden it's like, okay, I'm like eating all the stuff. What do I do with it? Where do I shuttle it? You know, how do I break it down your intestines? And so some people think that intermittent fasting is good because it gives your body a break. So it's not always on. Um, some people think that it leads to, you know, better changes in body composition. Um, that one study showed that intermittent fasting with resistance training did have positive changes in body composition, but you know, just resistance training alone for against that group. I mean, resistance training, if you're not done resistance training, you, you're definitely going to see a difference. Um, ultimately, again, and this is my personal opinion, what it boils down to is can you adhere to it and are you going to create a calorie deficit? Because at the end of the day, 
the way that you're going to lose weight is by eating less calories or consuming less calories than you burn. Mm-hmm. Now, there's a lot of different things that go into, you know, your your basal metabolic rate or your your total daily energy expenditure expenditure is what I should say. So your basal metabolic rate is kind of like what your body burns just being, yeah. you know, just live, just you know, keeping your brain alive, breathing, pumping blood, all that. And so I'm not that was not my favorite subject. So we'll say, let's say your basal metabolic rate is a thousand. Well then there's other things that make up, you know, how many calories your body burns. There's the thermic effect of food, but that really is not negligible. It's not a huge, you know, I would wish to tell you that had a huge effect on it. You can go eat more. Yes, exactly. more. What do we all want to hear that? <laughs> so it's, there's that. Then there's non-exercise energy. So that's fidgeting, brushing your teeth. People that fidget more obviously burn more calories at the end of the day. So start fidgeting, um, <laughs> walking to and from your car, things like that that are not exercise. And then obviously, if you exercise, you know how many calories you burn exercising. So let's say all of that combined you come up to 1300 calories a day for your total daily energy expenditure. Well, you need to consume a thousand calories then to lose weight. You know, you want to create, yeah, it takes 3,500 calories to either gain a pound or lose a pound. So over the course of a week, if you're creating a deficit of 3,500 calories, that's 500 calories a day. You could do it smaller. You could do 250, 250 calories less a day. Maybe that's a little bit more attainable. And then over the course of two weeks, Theoretically, you could lose a pound. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's kind of like what intermittent fasting helps with because, you know, you're eliminating a large block of time where you would probably normally be eating. Um, So, you know, if you're not eating 16 hours a day, you're probably less inclined. Well, you're not snacking on anything unless you're empty drinking calories, but you're just eliminating a big chunk of day where you're eating. So you're probably making it easier for those that can adhere to that to Mm -hmm. eat less calories. Right. And it's much easier to overeat calories than it is to exercise. You know, let's say you burned yes. like 500 calories exercising. Well, you need a gallon of ice cream. <laughs> Not even a gallon. Pint. There you go. A pint of ice cream in your... That's calorie rich. You know, because I hear a lot, and, and I've certainly been guilty of this myself. I hear a lot like, oh, but I... I don't eat pizza and I don't eat fried food and I exercise, you know, like, why am I not losing weight? And, you know, it boils down to like, well, portion control and how many calories am I consuming? You know, I'm consuming, you know, 3,000 calories of broccoli, which is like, wow, that's, how would you do that? I have no idea. You did that? No, I that? never did that. I'm just saying, I was using it as an example. Oh, my, oh my, I was wow. Just that you, I said you'd that. be green. <laughs> um, you know, and I'm, and I'm, well, you could consume 3,000 calories of broccoli with dip it in, in ranch dressing there or something. There you go. You know, that would definitely get you there something pretty like quick. Something like that, yeah. Uh, but ultimately, if I'm eating more than I'm burning, then, you know, I'm either going to mm-hmm. stay the same or, or gain weight. Right. So. Well, I found when I tried intermittent fasting, and I still I still try to do it, um, if you really stick with it, it, it works. And it works fast. Yeah. You, you can, you'll see the difference in a couple of weeks. Uh, the thing that I found the most important thing was to, you know, that actually, before I get into the most important thing, it actually forces you to schedule your food. It you will have make to schedule you, it. You're very you're I feel aware like you of it. Make much more educated decisions. Yes. You you eat with intention. Yes. You know you don't just plan. I mm-hmm. I eat because it's good. Right. Exactly. It's, and mine looks like you. And especially when you're vegging out on the couch watching TV, it's just nice to have that little hand to mouth motion. Right. Like Dorito, 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 Dorito. Who doesn't love a good Dorito, right? I came out with protein Doritos by class. Supposedly, the review, I don't like Doritos, but the review online says that the texture obviously is a little bit different, but the taste is on point. Yeah, but you know, it's probably a gateway snack. <laughs> you start with that, and then before you know it, you're eating you're, you're, lots of Oreos, you're, lots you're, of you're Doritos. Double, you're double bagging Cool Ranch. <laughs> you know, so I just stay away. But I found, like, if you're going to do the, because I was doing 18 hours off. Right. Six hours on. So what I what I said to myself was, okay, if you do eighteen hours off, you can eat whatever you want for six hours within reason. Right. You know, within reason. Yeah, you, know, you can't have cookies or, or chips or anything like that, yeah. or pizza, right? But you can have whatever else. If you want carbs, eat carbs. But right. Make sure they're you know not sugar, not white carbs sugar. Are not no, just be too many, right? right. And That's I found I we'll get back to carbs being the enemy. But I found if I okay, I ate my last meal at six thirty or seven mm-hmm. or seven thirty, I'd say the latest. Which meant I couldn't eat again until one o'clock the next day. Right. So my big thing was not when I woke up, I wasn't hungry. 
Okay. So no problem. So I, I could go easily till one without eating. My big problem was between seven and midnight. Right. So I had to train myself to go to bed at ten, like go to bed. Well, and I that think... was a big deal because now you're getting more sleep too. And you get sleep to make better decisions. Right. What I found very interesting, and I'm sure you're going to tell me why this is. Thank you. I've been working out and eating in 24 hour fasting. Um, at 7:30, I'm not hungry because I just got finished eating. By 9:30, I'm hungry again, and I know, and at least I think I know, it's just insulin. I it normally so it takes about I think three to four hours for your body to recover after a meal. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can eat certain foods that don't spike your insulin. You know, they came up with that whole little glycemic mm-hmm. index. Um, but also certain foods that would normally support my glycemic index, if you mix it with something else, doesn't spike your insulin okay. as high. So for instance, bananas by themselves, you know, are normally going to spike your, your blood sugar. But if you eat it with something like peanut butter, then it has a different effect. Really? Oh, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Um, so yeah, normally... There's a couple different schools of thought point to this. Some people say if you eat every three hours, you're training your body to accept food every or expect mm-hmm. food every three hours. Um, some of it could be boredom, some of it could be forced to have it. You know, mm-hmm. what I notice is that, you know, I'm normally hungry around the same time when I work at the office. If I have an all like a full day at the office, I'm normally hungry around the same time where I find myself snacking more. But if it's during the day that I'm not at the office and I'm doing other things and I'm out and about and I'm moving, I'm not I'm not hungry at the same time. And yeah, I think it's yeah, more because right. I'm moving and I'm not thinking You're about like, when can I have my next meal. Right, right. I can't eat. So because I know I can't eat, I think I'm mm-hmm. hungry. And I also, and this, I don't know how much like sports science this is. This is probably more like psychology stuff. But, you know, just because I think about a piece of food doesn't necessarily mean that I'm hungry. I think that sometimes we have our hunger cues, you know, mm-hmm. screwed up. And sometimes right. we're really just, like, thirsty. You know, I just mm-hmm. used to think that if I thought about food and that I had to eat it right away. Right. That makes sense. Like, oh, I thought about a cookie. I need to have a cookie now, right now. Right. Okay. Well, definitely get your cravings going. Um, yeah. well, that's interesting. So you're probably right. There probably is a lot just to do with habitual, like, this, like you're, you're always eating at 8.30. What's wrong with you? Right. You know? But I used to also eat a lot earlier. I used to eat at 5. Because I... I I'm not an old person. I just don't like crowds. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't. I don't mind. Like seven is not really late, so most people eat. But I used to eat at five. So if I go to a restaurant, I didn't want to stand in line. I, right. hate, I hate waiting thirty minutes for a table. I just won't do it. I'll just walk away. Uh, I'll go to I'll, 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 I'll go to McDonald's. <laughs> you know. But now my my wife and I, we cook ourselves our, our own meals. We eat around seven thirty seven, and then bed by nine thirty ten, and then you're up again at you know six in the morning. But I'm not hungry. I have my coffee and I'm good. Yeah, I, I don't eat first thing in the morning either. That's a, I think that's another thing, personal preference. I Growing up, I was always taught you have to eat breakfast. And if you mm-hmm. don't eat breakfast, you're going to get fat. Right, and, that was um, the common belief. And the study shows that's not true. Right. I mean, it doesn't show either one. If you eat breakfast or you don't eat breakfast, it doesn't mean that you're going to you know mm-hmm. gain weight. Right. Now, some people perform better, um, feel better. There, I think there are some studies that show that eating breakfast, you like, perform better on tests. Um, but I think I, I just can't eat food that way. I'm still half asleep when I wake up. And so I teach exercise classes and like I teach the first class is at six thirty, which means I'm normally up at five thirty so I can get to the gym with I am a big dork. I lay my clothes out the night before, I have like the K cup in the coffee maker and like ready to go. So literally when I wake up if that alarm goes off at five thirty, I am dressed with coffee in my hand and out the door within normally like ten minutes. Right. So I just you know just get up and go. Down to a science. I'm still waking up in my car as I plan. <laughs> and then I get there and I'm like, okay, now I gotta motivate people, you know. But I'm not ready to eat mm-hmm. either. You know? How do you feel though when you're when you're say doing a workout class? Because obviously you're doing it with them. No, not really. So mm-hmm. when I used to teach step aerobics, I would do it with them because it's a little bit different. It's a choreographed thing. You start at night and show them like, okay, we're gonna do this move and then we go on and then we're gonna do this move, this move, this move, whatever. So. The gym that I work at right now uh, uses a lot of like interval training or high intensity interval training. Um, and so we're zone based. And so every workout is different. Um, it depends. Like, for instance, today was a workout that we called performance. So, performance, think of agility, uh, running fast, jumping high, changing directions. We had ladders out. There was, there was five zones, and each zone had rounds. Each zone had four rounds. And so, 
the extent of me doing something is in the very beginning of the workout, I go through every exercise in the workout. So I'll start and say, okay, dome one, round one is burpee and tuck jump. And then I show like the one or two burpee tuck jumps so they know what it is. And then, you know, round two, med ball slam. So I show what the med ball slam is. And so then I'll go and I'll, I'll demonstrate each exercise one or two times, unless it's something that like everybody knows what it is, you know? Um, and then once I get the warm up started and once I get the workout going, then I just move always on the mic, always motivating people. But, you know, if I see that somebody is struggling with a movement, I go over there and I like try to give them some pointers. Or if I see that somebody, you know, listen, it's early or we get cardio brain and we forget what we're doing, or some people just don't follow directions well, uh, you know, so that you just go and you help people as well as motivate them. I'm really big on form um, because I feel like. You don't want to get injured. You know, you're doing this so you can like have a happier, healthier life. You don't want to do something completely incorrect. If I see somebody is really struggling with the form, I'm really quick to tell them to put the weight down and do it. You know, or you know, let's do a modification. That's the one cool thing at you know where I work right now at Sweat Equity. They there's modifications for everybody. So you know, I've had people. I have women in my class that you know are in their seventies, and I have women that you know are. 22 and just jumping and running and just blowing the you know 72 year old woman out, out the door but those you know those two women that that are older that come to the class they still get a great workout you know it, it's there's always a modification for something and plus there's it's fun i like group exercise not always sometimes i like to be on my own um but i like the group exercise sometimes just being motivated by the person sure. who's next to you yeah they can kind of compete with them a little bit right especially if they're better than yeah, because then you're like, oh, I can't stop doing this because right. they're not stopping, you know, right. and they're probably doing the same thing. And, mm -hmm. so. That's why it's nice to have a personal trainer to deal with you. Yes. Motivate a, you. I had a great trainer. His name was Paul. We can look Paul up. You want to sure. Paul up? He was Mr. Jamaica. Mr. Jamaica, cool. And he... So you can click on images, and there we go. That's Paul. This guy? <laughs> yes, he was my trainer. <laughs> <laughs> you really? You couldn't pick anyone that maybe wouldn't hurt you. <laughs> First off, this picture doesn't do him justice because he's like six feet something. So he's not only he doesn't look like this anymore. Obviously, he. Let me follow that. He's still huge, but he's not. This is this is like stage ready competition right. prep. Right. Sure. This is not necessarily the most easy thing to maintain the entire time. Right. Sure. Um, but he's huge. You know, he's mm -hmm. like six feet something. And so I, you know, when I I was thinking for a brief period of time that I wanted to do like a fitness competition. In fact, I'd still be really interested in doing one. They have a category called fitness where you actually do a routine yeah. and it reminds me of cheerleading and so i just really want to do it uh, it's just you know getting to this right stage leanness is definitely challenging it's a whole nother level yeah um, this is a this is very it's uh, a lot of just chicken and broccoli so i i yeah dry. <laughs> but i had Called him as a personal and trainer and i mean it was great because i i was never one listen as a trainer, just because I'm a trainer doesn't mean that I can't learn from somebody else. Oh, sure. You know, right. like I, I'm always, but I had, I struggled with ever getting another trainer because they just, they didn't push me the way that I knew, you know, I could be pushed. Mm -hmm. And he, he was great. I mean, he just, I would say like, oh, I'm tired. And he would just tell me to like, shut up. <laughs> and then, you know, I'd be like doing something and he'd be like, oh, this is, you're so embarrassing. He was like, work harder, you know, like, but it was great. That's what I needed because yeah. that. I needed somebody that was not going to like let me show up and say, Oh, I'm tired. I don't feel like doing this today. You know, like I would do something and he'd be like, What's wrong with you? Why can't you do more? You can do more. You know, like it was great. I had fun. I still train with him, not as frequently right now because of school and, you know, other things that cost money. I obviously have a personal trainer. Mm -hmm. um, but I was in the best shape of my life. And, oh. and this is, you know, another common myth. I was lifting heavy, heavy weight. I mean, I was. He, I think he had me squat, okay, only one rep I did, but 245s and 245s, so that's 90, 180 plus the 45 bar, so 225, 225 yeah, so I did one rep squat for 225, wow. and he helped me, but we routinely did stuff that was like really big for me, mm -hmm. 
you know, and and I I know because of what I've learned in school, but yeah, you know, I I wasn't thin. Mm-hmm. I was I was probably smaller. I had less body fat percent then than I did than I do right now. Wow. You know, and I was lifting heavy weights, but I also wasn't over consuming calories, so naturally my body's not going to get bigger. It mm-hmm. takes. It's harder for women to look like that than they think it is. I hear right. a lot of women say that they're like afraid to work out because they don't want to look manly. Mm-hmm. I can almost promise you that any woman that looks manly or is that that's really big because there are women bodybuilders out there, mm-hmm. um, they're on something. Right. They're taking right. something, mm-hmm. you know, to, to make them because it's just women are not genetically designed to be like that. Mm-hmm. You know, they can be bigger. But it takes some serious steroids to get like right. You get jacked up like yes. that. Well, even when you're on steroids, you still have to work and you still have to restrict your diet so you well, can yeah, get lean like that. Yeah, people don't get that. If you take steroids and you don't change your diet and you don't work right. out, you just get fat. Like, yeah, nothing's gonna change. I know. Well, yeah, you might, yeah, you'll get large and then charge. Oh. Well, usually, it's people that take steroids are already in the gym trying to get right. gains and they can't see their gains, so they take steroids. But isn't it true that not everyone, like you said, for women, but not every man is genetically predisposed to be huge? No, I some mean, men are some of not. it is genetics. Some of it is genetics. Some of it you got to blame your parents right. for. Well, I mean, if you're if you're five feet tall or five foot six like me, you're just not going to be huge. You're not going to be taller. You're, you're not going to be big like this guy. You're just not. Yeah. It doesn't mean you can't have a good life. It just means you're not going to be big. So Tim is my fiance, and he played football in college, and he. He's like a relatively small guy. He's 5'10", and he's slender. He's lean, but he, he's slender. And he talks about, you know, he does talk about when he played college and football, he had to eat 4,000 calories a day to, you know, just try to keep the weight on mm-hmm. to, you know, play football. Right. So, and, and he talks about sitting in, the, like, the college cafeteria, just, just shoveling the food in. Shoveling the food in, you know. I didn't have that problem. I gained, like, a bunch. Yeah, I, I didn't. I never. <laughs> I've never had a problem getting weight on. It's the other other way that I have a problem. But hey, that's life, you know. But the thing is, when I was growing up, and you're not that much younger than me, people didn't understand nutrition like we understand it now. Like back in the day, you were supposed to eat fat, right? Because that's what you had. You know, here you go. I didn't have a very. I don't have a very rich family, so it's what we had. You eat right. this because that's what we're eating. And if you don't eat this, you don't eat. Right. So I eat that. No problem. And my parents, you know, they're not they're not bad people. They just didn't know. You know? Well, and everything's always changing. I right. mean, you know, five years ago, we were probably telling people to do something different than they are telling now. I mean, that, and I think that goes with a lot of different things. I mean, as the science can, and the research continues and, you know, they make new breakthroughs and they discover new things. I mean, what was it, 20 years ago, they put everybody on Fen-Fen because they right. thought Fen-Fen was going to be great and, like, mm-hmm. people had heart attacks and died. Right, you know? right exactly. So I think that... Oh, it was only, what, 15 years ago that eggs were the enemy. Yeah. Eggs were, you're going to kill yourself if you eat eggs. And now you you need some yeah. fat, you know? Some fat, fat is essential for certain, you know, processes in your body. You can't eat right. no fat. You will literally be evil. I find if I don't eat any fat, I'm starving all the time. If I eat just a little bit of fat, I'm, I'm good. Well, that's the cool thing. Like I fat could. and and fiber take longer to digest. Yeah. Therefore, it keeps you satiated and go longer. Right. You know, there's always tricks that you can do to try to stay full longer. Um, you know, anything, drinking water, being mindful when you eat, mm-hmm. not having eight million distractions going on when you eat, stuff like that. Right. Isn't that interesting how people, they're right, when they're distracted, they just... just keep going. Like a big bowl of popcorn that you look at, you go, I couldn't possibly eat that. Put a movie on that you're interested in. Well, you know what's crazy you know, too is incredible. that if you don't portion it out, so eat peanut butter in your jar. Mm. If you weigh an exact like two tablespoons, mm-hmm. or you and then and then put the peanut butter away and say, okay, this is all I'm eating. Or if you just open the jar and just put right. it you eat, and just before you know it, well, it was for me. Right. Like, you know, you're like, tall. whoops, <laughs> like, oh. uh oh, big problems. Peanut butter is delicious. It is. So, listen, I can talk for longer if you want. I don't want to keep you here all night. We're already at uh, 6.30. Uh, all right. So, what, what, I usually, what, what I always do is okay. give my guests the last word. Whatever you want to say, the floor is yours. Oh, geez. That's so much. Um, <laughs> Take all the time you need. Exercise. Exercise is great. Exercise your mind. Exercise your body. Um, you'll feel happier. And it's just, 
it's fun and you make new friends that way and don't be afraid to try new things don't be afraid to listen everybody that exercises had to start somewhere you know and that's the same with nutrition don't ever be afraid to ask for help um, and then the only thing that I would say is that if you are, you know, doing online coaching or of any sort, or you're, or you're getting your information online, um, look for the research that backs it up. There's so many claims out there that are just so backwards that, you know, look for the claims that back, look for the research that backs it up. And obviously, I love anything International Society of Sports Nutrition. The JISSN is a great website to look at for sports nutrition. Um, but you know, basically if it's not trying to sell you something and it has maybe a control and a variable group, then it's pretty safe to say that, you know, there's something for that. So great. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks.